On this episode of This Is Game Boy, Mula's ancestors punch some Romans or wherever you came from. Welcome everyone to another episode of This Is Game Boy Not Light. Crazy, I know. I am E Blooded Candy or EBC, and with me, as always, once or twice a month, is Mula. Hello. Um, so before we dive into today's very European game, <laughs> what have you been up to? Mm, I've been playing them games. Making making some progress with the portable pleasure, for sure. Um, I actually went through some Sachen games, um, and I know it, it always get like they get a bad reputation not being a licensed developer for the Game Boy games. But honestly, all the games I've played so far, uh, except for Arctic Zone because that one is just a complete mess. Um, all of the other games from Sachen have been actually very enjoyable. So. Um, yeah, I've played through Zipball, which is a super original take on on a puzzle game where you like you're a cursor and and there's a ball constantly bouncing around and you have to like hold it in place at certain positions and then shoot it a different direction, um, avoiding all enemies and collecting a key and then the exit opens. Like it, it sounds simple and it is simple, uh, but it's a really enjoyable game um just the last stage was a little bit too difficult compared to like any other stage in the game uh but besides that it's 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 actually pretty cool um i've also done sky ace which technically i didn't beat because it is unbeatable if you just play it um it might be because of the way you have to get roms for these games um it could be that the it's just defunct uh, from the get-go, but uh, it, it's like you cannot shoot the bosses in this game. They just don't have any hitbox, so you can progress. Um, and it, it's just a shmup, by the way. <laughs> I forgot to mention that. Uh, and it's, it has five stages, but luckily some brilliant mind uh, made up some game genie codes that skip those boss fights so you can play all the stages at least and get to the end. Um, so I've done that. I, the video I made was like, this is the only way we can play this game right now. So maybe in the future, because Lex did actually get a uh, ordered a copy of this game. So maybe uh, when that arrives, we can see if, uh, yeah, it, it's a problem with the ROM or it's just badly programmed. Like it is possible. It, it's still socking. Um, I, I own a foreign one with Sky Ace in it and I... I have never popped my socken into into my Game Boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The only the only socken game I own, I have never played. Yeah, it, it's kind of weird. Like again, I should make a socken episode in the future sometime, uh, but I have to do some more research on that. But basically, the socken games were made for their own uh, Game Boy clone called the Game Duck, um, and then they ported those games in four in one compilations for Game Boy. Um, again, that's all unlicensed, of course. So there might have been some problems converting them to a Game Boy cartridge or something like that, but we'll find out in the future. That's how Wisdom Tree was, too. Like, yeah. like, you can't dump Wisdom Tree games very easily because they're unlicensed, and the ROMs that you can find are real, real messed up. Yeah, so that that's probably the issue there, but we will see in uh, the foreseeable future. At least. Um, the last one I played was Worm Visitor, which is a Frogger clone, but I think this game was a lot better than Frogger, to be honest. Um, if you just play Frogger for Game Boy, it's the four same stages over and over again just to get a high score. Um, this has 40 stages. Um, well, basically 20, uh, but the, the second loop, everything gets like a little uh, faster when it comes to cycle, so... It kind of makes a different stage, but it is the same stage. But at least it had more uh, stages to offer than Frogger did. So I, I like this more. <laughs> so good job, Socket, actually, on that. Um, beyond that, I've played Otto's Audi Fountain, which probably nobody has ever heard of before. That is a 
a German comic uh, and cartoon with, uh, and a game got made out of that by the same people actually who uh, made the game we are going to talk about today. Um, so many people probably have heard of Adventures of Pinocchio on Game Boy. Um, not the, the Virgin game, but like uh, the other one that is not released ever, but there is a prototype and you can play it. It's the exact same game. Uh, but yeah, this one got released, the Pinocchio one never got released, so there's only the prototype of it. So it's like a isometric puzzle platformer with 130 stages, I believe, but they're all like 5 to 10 seconds long, so um, it's a fun game. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, sometimes the perspective is... it doesn't make sense, but... That happens a lot with these isometric games, so um, I don't think they're at fault by <laughs> making it bad. I think it's just the way everything is portrayed, that it sometimes just doesn't make sense. Um, beyond that, I played Godzilla Kun. So not that weird Godzilla Japan-only game, but I did play the Japanese version of this game because it's faster. Uh, it has a different layout, but I think it has the same puzzles. Uh, but it's just more pleasant to play than the European or American version. I don't know why they changed it up so much. Um, but is Godzilla, Godzilla Kun is very cool. Is Godzilla Kun the one where like the punching glove comes out of your face when you push a rock? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Uh, not based on Godzilla, but based on Godzilla Kun, which is an anime uh, with shibby Godzilla characters. So it's a little bit more tongue-in-cheek and not like the actual Godzilla. Well... I mean, those are also yeah. kind of tongue-in-cheek, but uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's based on a cartoon and not the, the actual movie, gotcha. so uh, it's it's something completely different. Um, after that came Power Racer. Um, I a, absolutely do idea. not like arcade-type oh, games oh, or, or Atari-type games. Oh god, I hated this game I, so I like Power Racer. Yeah, I, I'm just, it's just a genre that goes beyond me i guess uh i never grew up with these types of games like i started gaming from the nes era uh, onward basically uh pac-man is probably the only real arcade type game that i played when i was a kid that one is fine but all these other types of games are i, I just don't see the appeal of them uh, whatsoever. So this one was rough for me to get through, but it's a fine game. Um, and talking about Pac-Man, you could say this is a Pac-Man clone, but actually this came out before Pac-Man. So Pac-Man is a clone of this game, uh, <laughs> and it's hard. So, uh, but yeah, it's a it's a probably a well-known game, uh, but it's super old. You're you're just a car that drives around automatically, and you have to collect all the dots and not run into the other quote-unquote racers. That's uh, yep. That's literally all there is to it. Um, after that, I played uh, another one of those very amazing uh, PowerPoint presentations on Game Boy uh, called NHL Hockey 95. Uh, this is, I mean, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know why they would even release something like this. I've played 96 uh, before, like two years ago. I shut it down after 20 minutes because it was literally unplayable because it uh, goes at two frames per second. Uh, this one probably doubles that up. It goes at four frames per second, um, <laughs> but it's it's just not good. It's not but a fun game. But it's Super Game Boy Enhanced. It's Super Game Boy Enhanced, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a border and, and that's pretty much it. Uh, yeah, it's totally not fun to play. If you want to play a hockey game on Game Boy Play, either Hit the Eyes or Blades of Steel. Yeah. Those games actually work the way they are supposed to work. And, they're, and uh, they're fun. And they're fun, yeah. And this is just, yeah. They put it out there, but nobody asked for it and nobody wanted it. True. And I feel bad for everybody who actually got this game <laughs> and was like, oh, wow, look, I got that HL on Game Boy. And yeah, it's... Uh, Wow. <laughs> I mean, I own it, but I only paid five bucks for it. So. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if I actually own a cartridge of this, but uh, yeah, it, I will never <laughs> play this again. I just did the, uh, the playoffs. Um, yeah, yeah, whatever. It was two hours of 
Vancouver <laughs> winning 10 to 1, but not having fun at all. So well, you <laughs> really? Vancouver and not Minnesota? Well, I wanted to pick Minnesota, but Minnesota is not even in this game. So Oh yeah, they went to Dallas at that point. Yeah, yeah. we didn't have a team for a while. That's right. <laughs> so yeah. Vancouver it was. Uh, but yeah, beyond that, uh, I played a Simpsons game, and everybody's gonna be, oh no, Simpsons games, they are horrible. Um, well, actually, this one was not that bad. Um, it's Bart and the Beanstalk, um, which I think was the last one that came out for Game Boy. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, not sure. But yeah, it's of course uh, based on uh, Jack and the Beanstalk. Is that what it's called in English? Yep. Uh, yep. So yeah, it's based on that, but with Simpsons characters. It's uh, six stages, I believe, two auto scrollers uh, right at the end. But it's a pretty simple platforming game, and it controls amazingly well. To be honest, um, you only have three lives, which is kind of scary uh, when you first start playing this game. But uh, I mean, I liked it. It's it's yeah, f from all the Simpsons games. <laughs> Besides Itchy and Scratchy, um, this is probably the best Simpsons game uh, that I've played so far. And I know Krusty's Funhouse is still uh, on the horizon, but again, yeah, that's like a puzzle game. Like it's, like it's hard to compare. Game, yeah. Like, yeah, it's not like the NES Bart Simpson games or anything like that. It, yeah, so Bart and the Beanstalk, I would recommend you give it a go because it's really really it's the only bark game i haven't played yet i actually oh, liked camp yeah. deadly as as i as did bad not as I, that that sounds, I actually enjoyed camp deadly i hate the controls in in that game it just didn't feel correct but then this one it yeah it works like it should it's supposed to work so i mean the game itself might not be the greatest but everything works <laughs> so that's uh that's a big thing uh, for Simpsons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, now, currently, I'm actually playing Battleship. Oh. <laughs> Battleship is not a game meant to be played against a computer. Because, of course, the computer always knows where everything is. So, um, it's all just pure luck winning against the computer. And you might think, like... Oh, but you just win one round and you're done with that game, right? Nope. Nope, that's not how Battleship works. Um, it's actually a port of an earlier Game Boy game called Navy Blue, which came out in 89, um, which is based on the principles of Battleship, but you get, like, special abilities uh, for your ships. Like, you have a scanner, you have, like, triple missiles, double missiles, or, like, the harpoon, what they call it, which is a... A bomb that hits five squares in an x-shaped mark um, and there's other things as you progress um, that game consisted of 100 stages I believe um, <laughs> luckily I'm playing the US version uh, which is only for only uh, uh, <laughs> which is 48 stages um, uh, yeah it's it's just it's not fun. You're just sitting there praying that the first move you make hits his submarine, which is a one square ship, something that doesn't exist in Battleship to begin with because it's totally unfair. Uh, and if you don't hit it, you're probably going to lose. If you hit it at the start, you're probably going to win. So, and it's that 48 times in a row. Oh, that that's all there is to this game. And now I'm like at stage 20 out of out of 48 so this game is gonna take 20 hours just because it all depends on luck literally everything depends on luck i haven't done battleship yet but i did radar mission and that game mm -hmm. was a game so i can't imagine yeah what that's uh, gonna be like. yeah that's uh that's a thing um there are like seven or eight battleship games on game boy um and they all are, yeah, they all have the same problem, basically. Um, you're always going against a computer, and the computer knows, and it's not fun, yeah. because you can't really do anything about it, so. Um, it just, you're sitting there praying until the game ends, so. Uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll get through it, I guess. <laughs> um, and then the, the last Game Boy game I'm also currently playing is X. Uh, people probably know that game. Um, it's the how do you call that? Uh, 
Look, it's the precursor to Star Fox. It's literally made by the same people. Um, and this was their prototype, basically, to make that game. Um, out of everything they learned uh, programming a game like that, they actually were able to make the Super FX ship, I believe it's called. Yep. Uh, yeah, so this was a prototype for Star Fox, basically. Um, sadly, it only came out in Japan. Because this is a marvelous game for Game Boy. Like, yeah. The, like it's incredible what they did um maybe we should do an episode about it on in the future but it's incredible what they did and how it works and um yeah i would recommend everybody play it but uh search for the translation patch online on, on rom hacking uh, because otherwise you will not be able to tell what you actually have to do in each stage so um that's the one i'm playing and i'm at mission seven but i don't know how many missions there are i think eight or ten uh something like that but incredible game it's unbelievable how quote-unquote smooth this game runs on a game boy um the only lag that happens is when there's like three enemies on screen and you're shooting like like a crazy person but otherwise it plays really smoothly and it's just incredible to see um but yeah, that's all I've been doing for Game Boy. Uh, so I am making a lot of progress. Maybe I'll get to 450 by the end of the year, but I doubt it. Uh, but I've been playing some other games as well. First one being Slave Princess Sarah. Uh, yes, that sounds bad, I know. Um, it's basically <laughs> an adult take on uh, Final Fantasy Adventure or Mystic Quest. So it's like completely the same uh, idea as Mystic Quest or Final Fantasy Adventure or... Second then Setsu, uh, if you want to go with the actual name of the game. Um, it's it's fun, um, it, just not as deep as uh, Final Fantasy Adventure would be. Um, it's a little more on the surface. But yeah, it's an adult game, so it's a slave princess and you're captured and you and your sister are getting abused and yada yada yada. But deeper than that, the story hasn't gone and I don't think it will go. So, uh, yeah. Besides that, it's, it's literally just like... Like Final Fantasy Adventure. And it's fun to play. Um, so, nothing more that I can say about it. Because I haven't finished it yet. Um, <clears throat> and then I made a very, very stupid decision. Uh, during Black Friday sales. Uh, by getting that Stranding. <laughs> first of all. Uh, I've only played like five hours until now, um, so can't really say much about the game, but it's Kojima, so it's watching a movie and sometimes you move your character around. It's going so, to be weird. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I like it though. I, I think it's it's great, but yeah, I mean, it's not for everybody, but uh, yeah, hoping to get through that uh, sometime, um, which was my original plan to just play that. Um, but then I also made the mistake of getting Persona 5 Royale <laughs> because people have been bugging me to get Persona 5 ever since the original came out. And I was like, no, I do not like Persona games. I never liked Persona games. They're just absolutely boring and I don't like uh, random generated dungeons and things like that. It's just not for me. Uh, but yeah, people kept bugging me, so I eventually get the Royale version. And I absolutely love this game it's so so good i don't know why it's so good but it just clicks like across the board with me it's one of the most stressful games i've ever had to play just because of it simulates real life basically like you have to go to school you have to do your chores you have to meet up with your friends you have to do this you have to do that and after a while, you're like, oh my god, what am I going to do first? Oh, I have to blow this person off to do this thing and this thing. And it's crazy. And, and you're also time constrained, quote unquote, because you have to do certain things before a set date. And it's, it's just crazy. <laughs> but I love it. I'm 45 hours in now. I know this game is going to take me 150 hours in total. But uh, it's hard to put down whenever I start it up. Usually because... When I'm playing it and I want to put it down, uh, a cutscene starts happening that takes like half an hour and I'm just sitting there. Uh, but yeah, I think I can recommend this game to everybody, even if you're not a fan of RPGs or what I said, like um, 
basically a visual novel with choices you have to make to progress and things like that. Um, this game is absolutely, absolutely fantastic. Wow. I, I, so I bought Persona 5 Royale as well, too, when it came out a year or two ago, however long ago it was now. And uh, the last Persona I played before this was 2. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was like, well, Persona 5 is so great. I'm like, well, Persona 2 was all right, but I haven't played 3 or 4. Like, should I play them before 5? Like, oh, no, no. I'm like, okay. And 5 is still sitting on my shelf in plastic wrap, as is, <laughs> as is Death Stranding. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, both very time-consuming games. Like, that Stranding is also 100 yeah. hours, so... But yeah, I had to buy something because I ain't getting a PlayStation 5 anytime yeah, soon. Same. So, I mean, I was like, now I'm going to get these games because I have like a year or a year or two before I even think about getting a PlayStation 5. So, uh, yeah, the, these were the best games for me to get, but it's going to take me forever to beat both of them. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you could play WoW with me, yeah. you know. No, <laughs> never. <laughs> that is something I will never do in my life. <laughs> yeah i've uh with with the new expansion that came out at the end of november i have poured more time than i would like to admit into wow again um it's starting to slow down just because like i've i've seen a lot of the end game stuff now that the uh, first patch of the expansion has to offer so like my my play time is definitely slowed down quite a bit but uh, i still have put more hours into wow in the last month than i have probably in the last like three years so that's been a thing um on top of that my my community ray or uh, raised ninety thousand channel points uh for a donkey kong country trilogy playthrough so i'm uh i haven't started nice. that yet i was supposed to be this weekend <laughs> but i decided to be uh a 16 year old and pull an all nighter on Friday and you can't do that at 33 years old anymore. Mm -hmm. So I basically have slept all weekend. <laughs> um, <laughs> so that'll be next weekend. It'll be Christmas weekend for the DKC trilogy playthrough. Uh, I can't wait to get DMC eight for that. And then, uh, <laughs> I've been, I've been, as much as I complained about Assassin's Creed Valhalla, I'm still playing it. I had us restart it over <laughs> a third time, but wow. I'm playing it. So I have 30 hours into this game, and I haven't, I technically haven't even left the intro area because I've had to restart it three times. Jesus. <laughs> For those of you wondering why, there was a, when the game launched, there was a game breaking bug on one of the missions, one of the starting missions, like 10, 15 hours in, uh, where a boat ends up on land and all of your cutscenes and all of your NPCs can't go where they need to go to trigger the, the rest of the mission. And the only fix for it is to restart your game. And I was I was in doubt, and I was denied. I'm like, no, there's got to be other ways around it. So I played it for like another 20 hours, and I realized, I'm like, nope. I have to restart <laughs> the game again. So uh, I'm on my third restart of Assassin's Creed Valhalla. So we'll see how that goes. Um, I, have, <laughs> I have Cyberpunk here. Big chilling on the shelf. <laughs> I've uh, I've heard some choice things about it, and uh, I kind of want to see see yeah. those choice things about it, but uh, we'll we'll see how it works on, on a day one PS4. <laughs> um, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, outside of that, I haven't done too terribly much with gaming related stuff. Uh, I've been trying to get through some scans. Like I I think I finished all of my Game Boy Color ROM dumps now. So, those are done. I need to get those over to Lakes for the database. And then I'm going to start my GBA collection, which that's going to take me like a half hour because I have no GBA games at all. Because <laughs> GBA is the worst. Um, but yeah, I've been slow, slowly poking at that. I still have another like 70 manuals I need to get through. And uh, I don't like scanning manuals. So... <laughs> Yeah, that is uh, yeah not fun at all. Like, not none of these things are fun. 
to be honest, like that rom dumping is also not fun. But I enjoyed the rom dumping. The rom dumping I thought was probably the, is has been the funnest part of this whole project. The manual, the manual scanning. Oh, oh, it's so boring. <laughs> And, yeah, and then yeah. you get the manuals like the F-18 turn and burn or whatever the heck it's called. It's 52 pages long. You're just like, <laughs> oh, why? <laughs> <laughs> and my scanner takes a year to scan anything too. Like Lex is like, it takes me 10 minutes to do a 20 page manual. I'm like, okay, well it takes me an hour because my scanner's slow. So... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, the scanning goes pretty well with me, but I'm glad I'm done with that. Just, I'm I'm about to take your approach and just start pulling out the staples and just doing it yeah, that, that way. Um, makes it a lot easier. Yeah. Besides the fact that you still have to Photoshop paste everything together again in the correct order, but yeah. Yeah. But I think I'm gonna start start doing that here soon. So I noticed in like my last manual scan that had a lot of pages that started getting crooked because there are so many pages stacked on top of each other. And I was like, all right, all right, well, I might <laughs> just start doing it this way. Because I have a stapler now that I can staple back into it again. Ah, that's very yeah. useful. Yeah. Well, I, I needed it for the friggin' NES manuals because half a minor. The, the, sta <laughs> the staple holes are so loose in them now because, you know, they're 30-some years old. Yeah, and heavy use and whatnot. So I had to. I broke down. I bought one for like ten bucks. I was like, you know what? This ten dollar investment is going to be great. It works all right, but that's all you can ask yeah, for. Yeah, it works. That's all I care about. So <laughs> <laughs> it it beats pounding the staple back in via a piece of wooden hammer. That's what I had to do the first couple. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, <laughs> And everyone there is like, oh my god, he's archiving stuff? Listen, alright? <laughs> <laughs> you do what you gotta do sometimes. <laughs> um, but that's all I've been up to. So, uh, yeah, not nearly as much as Mo. Not yet, in a way. I'm, my, my, December is weird. Like, working from home is weird. So, I started working from home back in March. And... I lost, from March, I have lost all concept of time. Like, I don't know what time of day it is mm -hmm. anymore. I don't know what day it is anymore. And I also forgot what month it was two days ago. Like, working from <laughs> home has just destroyed all sense of time for me. So, like, Mo and I were supposed to record yesterday. And I didn't realize I pulled an all-nighter Friday night. Until I looked at my clock when Mo was like, why are you still awake? I was like, what do you mean? And I look at the clock. It's like five in the morning for me. And I'm like, oh, well, <laughs> I guess I'm going to go to bed, you know? And I woke up at four in the afternoon. So, um, oh, yeah, it's it's so it's so bizarre. And like right now with December, like I have, I have a bunch of days off because I have to take a bunch of days off. So like I had a three day three day weekend this weekend. Next weekend, I have like a four day weekend. And the weekend after this, I have another yeah. three day weekend. So, like, I'm just, and I'm a type of person that doesn't take time off of work either. Like, I'm a person that would just, like, I have days off. I should take them. But at the same time, what am I going to do with them? I can't leave my apartment and I can't really do anything right now because of pandemic. So, like, I have all this weird time <laughs> off, too. So, like, my, my, my whole, like, time sense is just so screwed up right now. <laughs> Especially since we're releasing a light, a, a, another light back to back too. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that one was my fault because I lost track of what we were releasing when. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll I'll get into that a little bit later. Why this episode is a little bit later than usual, <laughs> but yeah, I, even my schedule is getting completely mixed up with uh, yeah. with all these things. Like I've been. I've been jobless since April, um, so for me it's even yeah. worse. Like knowing what the hell is going on in the, <laughs> in like everyday normal life. So yeah, everything just blends together eventually. It's like oh, have a great weekend, and you're like, 
Yeah, but like that's the same as every other day <laughs> for me for the past <laughs> seven months. So I don't really have a weekend anymore. It's just all the same. Right. You know, and like people ask me, like, "Oh, you must be nice working from home." I'm like, some people might like it. I am not one of those people. I would very much rather <laughs> wake up at eight o'clock, shower, and go to an office than wake up not shower for three, four days, and then just go to sit at my desk and work for the next eight, nine hours, you know? Like, <laughs> uh, just I don't I don't enjoy working from home. Yeah, I do because that's what I did before. Yeah. Is, but then you, like, I still have the same schedule. Like, I wake up at the same time and I go to bed at the same time, usually. Unless, like, I'm really doing something that it might be a little bit later. Uh, that I go to bed, but I I still stick to a very normal schedule when it comes to that. But yeah, I mean, if you're actually working, you know, you have to put those seven to eight hours in uh, that are very structured in your life. And now I'm also working a lot, quote unquote, like I'm I'm drawing, I'm doing things for the database, yeah. I'm uh, streaming, which is kind of a job, really. Um as a challenger, like, I really have to put the hours into beating those games and things like that. But it's all just whenever I want it to. It's it's not structured at all. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. It, it, such, a, such a weird year. Yeah, I mean, I sure. started picking up drawing as well, too. Like, Mo and I joined uh, Mom's Art Club thing together. So, you know, on top of the drawing for that, you know, all the extra drawing that we do, like... Mo now has a t-shirt shop available. Yeah. You know, I do a bunch of gothic depressing drawings in my spare time because that's just how I am. So like, I don't know, it's just, it's just weird. Like it's, 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 it's tough. Like it's like in your spare time, you typically would like go out for a walk or go to the bar with friends, go shopping, go do whatever it mm -hmm. is that you did. And now it's just like, all right, well, I'm going to sit at home and, <laughs> Do, you know, <laughs> do nothing. <laughs> so, but yeah. Anyways, on that on that note, um, <clears throat> this episode is very European that we're about to get into, or at least this this game is going to be very European that we're going to get into. Yeah. Uh, we're going to be talking Absolutely. about Asterix, which was a very old comic uh, starting around what 1959 1960s uh, that got turned into yeah. a game but we'll talk more about that after this break everybody um mo i'm gonna lean pretty heavy on you since you have a lot of exposure to this being from belgium mm -hmm. and whatnot what is asterisks asterisk yeah we go. so um <clears throat> i would definitely recommend going back if you haven't done that before to my light episode about the infogram or infogrames uh, games where I talked a little bit about this as well, but uh, basically Belgium and uh, France have a huge history when it comes to uh, comics. Um, and it, it's not the same as uh, comics you would think of like in uh, America with all the superheroes, but um, it's, it's something that they call, which literally translates into comics, is bombe dessinée or drawn pictures basically that, that's like a literally translation so there's always been a a very very established uh like comic book how would you call it uh i want to go wanted to go with series but that's not it it's like a very very huge comic culture uh between the two countries and a lot of uh Comics you know, or cartoons you know, like Smurfs, uh, Tintin, Spirou, 
and of course Asterix, Lucky Luke even. They all stem from like that same uh, group of people who actually started making these comics. And Asterix is another one of these. So uh, this was actually uh, drawn by two French people, uh, René Gossini and Albert Uderzo. Um, they might have some Spanish roots actually. Uh, looking at their names, but uh, those are the creators of Asterix. And Asterix is based on, and here comes a little history lesson, uh, of the Gallic War that happened in Europe. And that's when uh, Julius Caesar uh, invaded what was then called uh, the Gallic region, or Gaul in total, which comprised most of uh, of Europe as you know it today like uh, it's Belgium France uh, Luxembourg I don't I'm not sure if Spain was part of it but it's like Germany and uh, like it's it's a very very big yeah. region um, and back in that era uh, Julius Caesar was writing a lot about his uh, his uh, efforts to take over this region um, and one thing he said was like when and this is a, like it, it is a it is a very famous quote, but um, he mentioned once that out of all the tribes he fought in Gaul, like the Belgian uh, tribe or the the Belgae tribe, uh, was one of the hardest he have ever had to fight because they were the bravest and things like that. And we in Belgium even have um, like a statue put up in one of our towns uh, for, and that's a guy named Ambiorix. Uh, who basically was uh, the chieftain or the king of uh, the Gaul um, tribe in what is now known as Belgium. So this comic is definitely loosely based on that, but Asterix lives in a village near like the, the northern side, uh, near the ocean of France, of course, because this is a fr <laughs> French comic. Um, and... They have this little Gaul village there and uh, Caesar is trying to take them over, but he can't, he can never defeat these guys because they have a uh, druid living with them uh, who made a potion that makes them stronger so they can always uh, basically kick their ass all over the place. And that is that is what Asterix is. So um, this is the, definitely French because later there is actually a comic called uh, Asterix in Belgium. So he does visit our tribe as well. Uh, but yeah, basically it's based on my ancestors, my European ancestry uh, of people during that that war. Um, the comic itself is uh, very comedic. Um, it's basically. Um, portraying all European countries in a very stereotypical way. So if you ever heard any stereotypes about uh, any European country, they really bring that forward into the comic books. And yeah, this is super popular, not only here, because I think this has been translated in 111 different languages, this comic. Um, and there have been like 25 movies or something like that. Uh, some live action, some cartoon movies. Um, and they even have like the Parc Asterix uh, in Paris, which is a theme park uh, for for Asterix. And yeah, it's uh, it's another publication from a Belgian uh, magazine uh, back in the days uh, during the war. They had a lot of these magazines where they had like short stories about not only Asterix, but that's also where Tintin comes from and uh, and Spiru comes from. That's like uh, collaboration between Belgium and France. So, yeah. That's a little history about Asterix. Oh. Interesting. So, of course, any good comic book and cartoon slash movie needs to have a video game. Of course. Hmm. That's just how it worked back in the day. Uh, so, <laughs> Asterix uh, came out in 1993 in Europe only. Um Developed yeah. by Bit Managers, not to be confused by Bit Studios like I was earlier today. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Bit Studios based in the UK, Bit Managers based in Spain. Yeah, so Bit Managers, so I, this, I think this is the first time we've had Bit Managers on, on podcast. 
because we haven't done Tim yeah Tam, the, 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 the first time we actually dive into it because I did the infograms or infograms um, light but I didn't mention that they only publish the games because they had the rights to all these comics but actually bit managers were the people responsible for making all of these games yeah so bit managers in 1988 was known as new frontier who initially did like the zx spectrum uh the amstrad the msx stuff um and it met a lot and uh the company first met uh with kind of okay success but in 1992 it changed its name to bit managers and began making games for nintendo more specifically focusing on the game boy uh and again like moda said and more focusing on the french and belgian comics such as asterix smurfs tintin and the such for infogrames uh, in 97, Bit Managers was chosen by Acclaim Entertainment to develop some games for Turok uh, for the Game Boy. And then in 98, uh, the year that the Game Boy Color was released, uh, Bit Managers uh, was the first third party developer to finish two Game Boy Color titles, Turok 2 and Sylvester and Tweety. Um, they would eventually get bought out by a Spanish arcade video game company called uh, Gelco, I believe it's pronounced. Um, and Bit Managers ported the Gelco arcade games like Radical Bikers to PlayStation. Uh, and then in 2001, they were <coughs> rebought again, they, or they bought themselves back essentially, repurchase. Uh, and Bit Managers continued their relationship with Infogrames, whom now is, I believe, SA Atari or Atari SA, I guess, uh, who is a mm -hmm. part of Ubisoft now, um, and developed several Game Boy Advance games. And then they have a new partnership that started in 2005 with a Spanish video game company called Virtual Toys, uh, and now remain as a subsidiary of Virtual Toys. But a cool part about Bit Managers is that one of their co-founders is Alberto Jose Gonzalez, whom is the composer for... I would, I think almost every uh, bit manager developed game out there. So yeah, yeah, he did. Besides one game, um, he did all the soundtracks for all the games, and uh, yeah, of course, everybody knows who he is because yeah, who doesn't know these soundtracks? Right. Yeah. Like I knew who Gonzalez was without like when we when we decided to do Asterix. I already knew who the composer was without having to look it up because I, I heard the music. Because Gonzalez has a very particular sound to his music, and it's very good. So without even looking it up, I knew who the composer for this was. And plus, anyway, with Infogrames and Bitman, and before I knew Bitman, which bit studios were different, like Infogrames in itself, like I knew Gonzalez had a pretty heavy hand in that whole relationship to begin with as well, too, so... Um. So yeah, we have a composer, developer, and a publisher for this game. Awesome. Yeah. And Mo. Yeah, yeah, that's what you get from European games. We actually do credit everybody who works on <laughs> it's games. True. It's true. The, the <laughs> credit sequence for this game is actually super cool. But uh, and they actually put credits in the manual too, which is even cooler. But uh, we'll get more into Gonzalez uh, a bit later because Mo had a very nice interview with him. Uh, a week, week yeah. or so ago so yeah and that is actually the reason why this episode is out a little bit later uh than it was supposed to come out uh because i contacted <laughs> Alberto gonzalez uh one week before recording this not realizing it was only one week before we were recording this um and of course, he's a busy person because he's still uh, working very hard in the video game industry. Yeah. Uh, so it, it, of course, took him a little longer than just one. Well, actually, he did reply in like five days. But uh, yeah. by then we were like, you know what? We'll just do a live in between and uh, make sure we get all the answers in before we actually <laughs> uh, record a podcast. So, yeah. yeah. But um, so, yeah, the plot of the game, I mean... Mo, Mo very much summed it up with uh, just talking about the comic, but in true uh, Game Boy fashion here. So out of the manual, the plot is <clears throat> the year is 50 BC, so we're already early, early on. 
Gaul is entirely occupied by the Romans. Well, not entirely. One small village of indomitable Gaul still holds out against the invaders. These courageous, tough, stubborn G Gregarious, why well, is a word I haven't read in a while? <laughs> Rowdy and yeah. merry Gauls fear only one thing: that the he that the heavens should fall on their heads. One day, the peace and quiet of this small village of indomitable Gauls is broken by a disturbing piece of news. Oblix has failed to return from his wild boar hunt in the forest. The village council convenes and Asterix volunteers to set off and find his friend. To find Oblix, you will have to travel throughout Gaul, across the Roman Empire, taking your quest as far af a far afield as the Egyptian pyramids. And all the time, you will have to battle with the Roman armies and avoid the traps set by Caesar's spies. So, Asterix is trying to save his friend Oblix from Roman capture. That's yeah. the plot. So what came first, Asterix and Obelix or Asterix? Because I know, I know there's Game two wise? games. Yeah. yeah, yeah, this one came out first. Okay. Uh, this, is, this is actually the first game or Game Boy game made by bit managers. Uh, like, I'll get back into that a little bit later, actually, but yeah. Okay. It, this is their first Game Boy game. Because I, I knew there were two. I know there's uh, Asterix and Obelix, and then there's Asterix. I wasn't sure which one came yeah. first or second. Yeah, this is the very first gotcha. one. <clears throat> Gameplay. Pretty basic platformer game. Yeah. Uh, a jumps, B attacks. Uh, you can sprint by holding down the B button. I would say, like... Out of all, the controls are they're fine. The controls are great. The 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 momentum because when you're when you're holding down the B button to sprint, it does take some momentum to get started sprinting. That took a little bit to get used to, but after the first couple of times of like falling off of an edge or dying or something, you do get used to it. Uh, it does. It did take a little bit to understand how it worked though. Uh, and then down ducks. So pretty basic controls. Yeah. I mean, you can't really well. <laughs> I was like, you can't get too crazy with Game Boy games, but I I played <laughs> NBA Jam, so uh, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> and Mortal Kombat, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, items. There's a bunch of different types of items in the games. Um, stars are your. Uh, I'm not going to call them currency. They're, they're like the coins you get in Mario or the rings you get in Sonic. You collect 50 of these stars, you get an extra life. Uh, and then Fora gives you 10 stars. Uh, there's a magic potion that will grant you uh, invincibility for a few seconds, but it gives you a speed burst. I actually found this to be some of the, one of the more useful items in the game, especially when it came to like the spike pits that we'll talk about in a bit. Um, <laughs> the shield gives you invincibility for a few seconds. I kind of found the shield to be pretty useless, in my opinion. Uh, they have the laurels, uh, give you an extra life. If you don't know what a laurel is, if you look at most Roman culture stuff, they have like that half wreath of of leaves. I don't know what type of leaves they are. They're not ash leaves, but uh, all of all of the leaves, uh, yeah. leaves. Yeah. So they have uh, so I got you know a half a half circle of of a wreath of, of olive leaves that you put on your head. Um, that's a laurel for those of you that don't know. Uh, and then a yeah. wing. So your HP is represented by wings. You have four wings, uh, but you can technically hit five times. Um, and you can find, <laughs> you can find wings throughout the stages. However, they, they're, they're pretty, they're pretty few and far between. I had a hard time kind of getting health in the game. So, yeah. um, and then you have a key that will access a bonus stage for you to collect a ton of stars and a one-up typically at the end of it. Uh, you're, you're never one-up starved in this game, that's for sure. No. Um, Mo, you got some notes here. <laughs> I do have notes, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, that's that's basically all the basics, yeah. That's uh, that's how it goes. Um, like the game itself consists of five worlds, I guess you can call them. Uh, 
each with a with a set of stages yeah. uh, in them. Um, but here's a thing I found out, and I actually only found this out by playing the NES version. Um, at the end of each stage, you get on some form of uh, seesaw, catapult, whatever you want to call it. It's like it has a rock on one end to jump on the other end, and then it's like swings you over to the end of the stage. Um, I always just did that. Like, okay, here's the end of the stage. Good. Uh, there it goes. But what I found out for, from playing the NES version, if you get to the end of that stage uh, there, um, you actually see that there is an arrow pointing um, between like two platforms, I guess. Um, and if you just stand on the thing, you fly over it and you end the stage. But you can actually uh, control Asterix while he's flying. And if you jump in between those things, where that arrow is in the NES version, you actually go to a bonus stage uh, where you jump on barrels on the ocean um, to get extra lives. A lot of extra oh, lives, yeah. by the way. Um, but yeah, I, n I never realized that until I played the NES version because in the Game Boy version, there's no arrow there. So... I never realized that was the bonus to get to. So oh, I was about to ask you, like, there was a, there's an arrow because I I didn't see an arrow either. <laughs> and yeah, no, in the Game Boy version, it's not there. So that's why I never like realized you could do something there. I thought, well, oh, this is the end. There it goes. Which, <laughs> when I think about it now, is a weird way to end the stage if there's nothing tied to it anyway. So it makes sense True. now. But thinking yeah, about it now, yeah, it is weird. Really like. But like, I just thought it was yeah. like, oh, this is a cool way to end the stage. Here you go. But yeah. <laughs> but yeah. So it, it is to get access to the bonus stage, and yeah, it's worth getting that because there's like so many one ups you can get there. So nah, that's pretty cool. Um, you can just get a ton. These of, are your you can just notes, get a ton of one ups. Just playing the game like yeah like i the first time i played the game i game over because i didn't fully understand what the heck i was doing but uh this my second actual like attempt at the game i think i entered like world three or world four with something like 20 some odd extra lives because mm -hmm. like in world in like stage one alone like there's there's a bunch of bonus games inside the actual stages themselves and there's just laurels, just big chilling out in the world. And like, there's these little blocks that have A's on that you bust them up, and they have a bunch of they have stars in them as well too. Like you're you're never starved for one ups if you actually like take the time and play it like a normal human. So yeah, absolutely, it is very forgiving. And there are also I think two continues or one continue in case you do game over. So yeah, it, it shouldn't be a problem getting through this game at all. No. And it has three difficulties as well, I think. Yeah, yeah easy, easy normal, normal and hard. hard. I, I'm not sure what the difference is between them. Uh, it might just be your amount of health, but I'm not sure. I actually did not try. I didn't that, either. So now that I think of, I played it on normal. So yeah, same. Yeah. My my big my biggest issue though with the game since we're on the topic of like pickups and things like that, it's just the lack of health uh, that you get throughout the game. Like you can get a bunch of the feathers in like the bonus games. If you get into the bonus game at the end of the stage, you can get a bunch of feathers to replenish your health. But like during like stage play, you don't, you don't get that many feathers to replenish your HP. And like towards the later stages of the game, more specifically four, three, like, holy hell is that stage hard because there's so much stuff coming at you um and your health doesn't replenish itself between stages so like if you if you nice. ended a stage with one feather you're starting the next stage with one feather so my that was my biggest issue with the game was just like the health management itself because i felt like they gave you a bunch of one-ups because they don't give you any health refill at all <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, they're they're a little bit more hidden. Like, you can find a few of them in the asterisk blocks spread throughout the stages, but there are not that many. It's usually like only two or max three, uh, if even. Yeah. So, no, it does want you to play a little bit careful. Yeah, and it's it's tough because when you're first playing the game, when you're playing the game blind, 
there's actually a lot of stuff that comes off the screen at you. Like, whether it's an acorn, a spear, or a catapult rock. Like, if you don't know what's kind of coming up, you're you're going to take a hit. Uh, just because, like, it does appear off the screen. You're kind of, like, the way you're playing the game, you're, your eyes are kind of all over the place because you're looking for those asterisk blocks to break for stars and potions and whatever else they're going to drop out of them. So you'll you'll never notice like a, a a projectile coming from the right side when you're looking at the left top corner of your screen trying to climb a tree to get to an asterisk block. So uh, that was like my mm-hmm. that was like a small issue I had with it. Like I'm used to that kind of stuff because I've played enough retro games to like know that that's a thing. That's just what happened back in the day. But that was like a, a small annoyance more than anything, especially when we got to like the catapults in uh, stage three. I think it was. Um, yeah but uh speaking of stages each stage world whatever you want to call it is made up of three three mini stages and then at the end of um stage dash three you get to jump across some some barrels and punch a (coughs) person (laughs) at the end of it (laughs) um but i did have a question for you yeah. Path. P A F. Is that just a, another word for blam, boom, wham, whatever? Or is it or is path P A F actually have like a hidden like a hidden meaning that I don't know? Because every time every <laughs> time Asterix punches something it says path. No, no, it's it's uh it's just one of uh and now I'm actually yeah, I thought it was that. Like it's an um, onomatopoeia, so it's just a word used to describe a sound, uh, so like boom, oh, it's or, like wham, or bam, like the yeah. old like so, '60s Batman. Okay, yeah. So bath is just one used in in mostly in French, I guess. Like it might show up in a few Belgian comics as well, but I think we might use another word. But yeah, that's it's it's just one of those things. Yeah, gotcha. yeah. okay. Because I because it because it do, it doesn't change stuff. The game it's path. Every time Asterix punches something, mm-hmm. path. And I just assume I'm like, well, maybe that's just the f- f- weird French way of saying wham or boom or something. But like, yep. But like the more I get to like play, I'm like, well, maybe path means something else, and I just don't know because I'm an American. <laughs> you know, <so. laughs> yeah. No, it's 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 just a sound. So. But, uh, yeah, so, like, once you've jumped across these barrels, punched the dude, uh, one punch sends him sailing into into God knows where, um, you move <laughs> on to the next stage. Which, this part, actually, it made me laugh. Before I knew what it actually was, which we won't say on podcast, it made me laugh hysterically. Because I thought these were, like, boss fights when I initially played the game. <laughs> so, I'm, like, jumping across these barrels because, like... Towards the end of the game, like the like these like the pits between the platforms for these barrels for you to jump on are are huge. Like these are large pits towards the end of the game, and I yeah. and I just thought they were like bosses. Like I'm walking, I'm like jump, 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 punch the dude in the face. He goes flying off, and it says, "Welcome to stage dash one." And you're just like, "Oh, was that a boss fight?" I'm like, "Well, that's pretty hilarious." Like you just walk up and punch <laughs> him in the face. Like that's good stuff. <laughs> And then uh, I mo marked some things in my notes and gave me a history lesson. I was just like, "Oh, okay, well, <laughs> gotcha." But um, <laughs> so I was like, "Well, yeah. it's still kind of funny, but not as funny anymore." <laughs> um, well, well, it, I mean. They just put him there because he's one of the he's a guys char- from the character, right? Yeah, he's a character in the comics. Uh, he's one of the gladiators, I believe. Yeah, um, and he's always together with like I with. I'm not familiar with the comics that much, um, so so I I can't like really pinpoint the characters. But he's always on a ship together with like either. An Irish guy, or 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 like a ginger Viking, or something <laughs> like that. Like he's always together with that guy. Huh. Uh, but yeah, the 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 entire thing of Asterix uh, just doing one punch and sending a guy flying is like 
one of the tropes that is in the in the comics like <laughs> if he uh, if he drinks the potion and and he just punches a, a roman guy like he literally punches them out of their shoes and all their all that remains are their shoes on the ground so it, it just it is funny in its own right yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh yeah so as you, if you remember the lore that we said, Asterix has to, Asterix has to go through the Gaul and then Egypt and <clears throat> into Rome. So stage one is the Gaul, which is a very typical platform, a uh, set of platforming stages. Um, hold right through the woods at a camp. You jump over some pits. Uh, obviously, you want to collect there. You want to break the Asterix blocks and collect the bonuses to get your one ups and your stars, but. Uh, it, pretty basic stage one stuff, you know, like nothing, mm-hmm. nothing too, too much to talk about. Uh, if you've played a basic hold right platformer, you've played stage one. I I will say though, because I know Gonzalez, I think had a some involvement with the with the graphics for this game as well too. Yes. Um, the the sprite work, like some of the sprites are a little eh. But like the background work on the stages are actually it's it's very well done, um, like the trees, the the uh, log walls for the camp. Uh, later on, when you get into like Egypt and Rome, like the actual like detail to like the actual structures that is is actually quite nice, um, for it being a, a fairly early Game Boy release. Uh, even some of the sprites are super cute. Like they're they're more cute than they ever ought to be. Like the little stump that throws acorns, like that shit's cute. Yeah, it it sucks <laughs> when you get hit by it from off the screen, but it's cute. It's a tree stump with some eyes inside of it, and that's throwing acorns. Like the acorns are actually like you can tell they're acorns. Like it's not just a a, a square. Like they're actually in the shape of an acorn. Um, I don't know. Overall, I thought like the sprite work in general was was great in the game. Yeah, like, you can definitely depict all the characters that are portrayed with the sprite work, and you can compare this game to the sequel, Asterix and Obelix, um, in the same way as you can uh, compare Super Mario Land 1 with Super Mario Land 2. Um, You can see that this was the first attempt, um, the first time they, they had to make a game for a Game Boy, and they did the best that they could with the knowledge they had back then. Um... And it works, like you recognize the characters and, and the backgrounds are, are fun and, and you know where you are, so it works very well. But if you look at Asterix and Obelix, they knew what they could do with the system. And if you look at the sprite work in that one, like it, it's so much more fleshed out and yeah, you can yeah, it's it's really like Super Mario Land one and two, like uh both games work probably as well, but like the amount of effort put into graphics and things like that really shines uh, just because of uh, the experience they had with the game. So, yeah, this was a really good first attempt. Absolutely. Super Mario Land 2 doesn't exist. <laughs> Fake game. <laughs> so, once you, once you get past the, the, the three stages of stage one, or the three mini stages of stage one, the Gaul, uh, you move on to Helvetia. Uh, which is your snow? You, you you gotta have a snow stage in a video game. That's yeah. just the rules what? of video game. Yeah, that's Switzerland, by the way, Alvetia. So snowy mountains again. Three normal platforming stages. Uh, this the this these set of stages had my favorite sprite, which are the walking snowmen that throw their heads at you. <laughs> uh, the, this is my this is my my favorite sprite in the entire game because the snowman is actually really cute looking as well too, and then as you approach it, it rips its head off and throws it at you, and it just keeps doing that. You're just like, oh yeah, my yeah. god! <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> the Romans have set a curse upon the snowman in Albania. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. When he... So I I don't remember exactly, uh, but I think I'm correct. W- wasn't stage two three Spain? Like I seem to remember the Spain stage, and I know it's in the NES version for sure. But I think it's the last part of the Helvetia line, or so. I I don't remember correctly now. 
Here, I can look it up quick. Well, it just yeah, said, actually, it yeah, just says two three. Yeah, is it is it water? Yeah, water with fish jumping out of it. Yeah. So yeah. Okay, I am correct. Yeah. So you go to Spain um, at the end of of this world. Oh, that's a trip. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't uh, like you're trying to get from France to Rome. Um, you're gonna, <laughs> you start in France, you go to Switzerland, and then suddenly you end up in Spain. Might have taken a wrong turn in Albuquerque right there, I think. My my question on this journey, my question is, they have to get to Rome, right, to save Oblix. Why are they going through Egypt as well? No idea. Because, <laughs> like, I, so, like my, 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 European, my, my, my European knowledge is pretty slim, but I'm pretty good at geography, and, like, I know how Europe is laid out, and there's no reason for Asterix to have to go to Egypt to get to Rome when he's already a part <laughs> of that landmass connected to Italy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, like, from a geographical standpoint, <laughs> this makes absolutely no sense. But of course, they just wanted to portray as much of the comics in the uh, in the game as well, uh, without making making any sense. Uh, but yeah, of course, if you know anything about Julius Caesar, he had an affair with Cleopatra yeah. in Egypt. So that also get gets portrayed in the. In the movies and in the uh, comic, of course. So I guess maybe he thought that Caesar would have been in Egypt uh, with, Unfair. It, yeah. with his uh, with his girlfriend, and went that way first uh, before finding out he actually was in Rome or something. Who knows? But yeah, Just big <laughs> it, with it makes no sense. The trip makes no sense at all. It doesn't. The, like the more so, yeah. like the Switzerland to Spain part is the weird one because like. We're going to go up more north, I believe, in Europe. And then all of a sudden, like, we're dropping way south, like, way southwest. Um, right? Yeah, yeah, so from France to the west into Switzerland, then all the way south. No, wait. From France to the east, I'm mixing my yeah. east and west up, like always. To the east to Switzerland, then all the way to the southwest. <laughs> to Spain, then going to Africa to get to Egypt, and then going all well, the way back. <laughs> the Spain to Egypt thing, like, at least they're making a closer approach to Rome, because they have to go southeast to get to, to get, go from Spain to Egypt. So yeah. at least they're making their way closer to Rome and not further away <laughs> <Yeah>. from it. <laughs> <laughs> but in, uh, in 2-2, uh, Again, like the the stage itself isn't too challenging. Like you know, the, the full stage two of Helvetia isn't too challenging. Uh, stage two dash two that I found a little challenging, more so because of like a mental uh, a- approach. Uh, you have some like teetering platforms, so you do have some like quote unquote mm. one block platforms to jump on, and some of these one block platforms are teetering platforms. So if you're on one side or the other, it's going to start teetering whatever side that Asterix is on. And even, like, the teeter is slow, so, like, you have a lot of time to react to said teetering, but it puts you, like, in a little bit of a panic, because, like, typically when people, like, jump onto, like, the one block or two block, you know, platforms, they want to take a little bit of time to, like, prepare themselves for the next jump, and you do have that time on the teetering platforms, but since it's teetering, it gives you a sense of, like, hurry you know a little bit of a sense of panic that oh my god they, this platform is moving is shifting like oh, i can't prepare uh even though the teetering is super slow and very approachable uh so that <laughs> that was one thing i noticed in 2-2 compared to the rest of the stage was that the teetering uh things did put a little bit of a panic in you know, but not enough to like really like throw you completely off Yeah, these are my least favorite stages, but I yeah, never same. like these types of stages. Like, I think it, it started with 1 3 in Super Mario Bros., where you have to. Bros? Bros. bros. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Bro- bros. <laughs> That's Super Mario Bros., yeah. Uh, it's a heck. <laughs> but yeah, it starts with Della, with, with like the mushroom platforms. Like, I never like uh, stages where. You don't have a bottom. 
basically. For the entire stage, so. I don't mind stages that don't have a bottom to them if the platforms are big. So, like, in 1-3 right. from Mario Bros., like, the most of the mushrooms are fairly big. It's when you get to, like, yeah. what is it, like, s- World 6, whatever it is, when, like, you still have the, the mushroom platforms, but now you have, like, these small moving platforms that flicker and whatnot yeah. because of old video game stuff. And now I'm like, okay, well, this sucks, so. <laughs> yeah. They just give you anxiety for no reason, and then you actually do make mistakes oh, that yeah. you otherwise wouldn't do. It's It's... Yeah, it's just uh, well, a psychological thing, I it's guess. It's like in Mario Brothers 3, whatever world that, that one thing is, where you have like that big cannonball with the fire behind it chasing you, and the only way to progress yeah. to the stage, it's a vertical stage. So you have to like jump in all these Koopas and like these small like clouds and everything else. But like you have to also like avoid like this cannonball because if it runs out of fire, it blows up, and oh god, just forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, stage three, Egypt. So <laughs> after our trip yeah. to Spain, um, uh, being attacked by piranhas that jump out of the water, uh, we move on to Egypt and this is where I started hitting the struggle bus a little bit in the game. Um, more so because of three, three, but, uh, in three dash two. So I'll rewind. Stage three is two platforming stages and a and a, a mine card stage, basically. Yeah. Um three two is your mine card stage, but if you're adventurous, you can skip almost this entire stage. Um mm-hmm. the mine carding itself, like I actually did the mine carding the first time through. Um the mine carding actually is kind of tough, but it's not tough in the sense that like it, it's bad control tough. It's tough in the sense that like things can go very quickly. You know, things go very quickly, and you you have to have so you have to have your your braid on reactive mode because some of those platforms are very short that you have to jump on and off of. Hmm. But um, if you're adventurous, you can just jump on top of the stage and just run across it like in Mario Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do have to calm down at some point, and A then you have to times, use the. Yeah. Yeah, the candle holders. Well, or, yeah, it's our candle holders yeah. to to like jump on, and those are very tidy. So yes, it's a little bit rough, but yeah, you can basically just skip a few things there. Yep, um, and you could take it all the way to the, like you have to jump down a, a couple times here and there, but you could pretty much take the ceiling all the way to the end. Three three yeah. is where it gave me a ton of deaths because at the start of three <laughs> three, you have a pendulum blade. With a spider and a spear man <laughs> throwing spears, like, <laughs> right away into the stage. So, uh, the reason this stage gave me the hardest time was because of tight corridors. Because, like, you're in, like, a... It's not a mine shaft. It's like a, it's like a pyramid tunnel. I don't know what to fully... I don't know what the proper name of it is. But, um... You're you're in a you're in a small corridor space, and you do have like these spiders that walk across the ground, and if you touch them, you get hurt, obviously, because logic. And uh, you have these spearmen that are just big chilling, waiting to throw spears at you. You have these pendulum blades, but like these pendulum blades, like you can't duck over, you can't duck around. You have to wait for them to like go out of bounds before you can walk past them. The spearmen have to duck, and I couldn't kill a spider if my life depended on it. So you have to. I, I tried to jump over them, which I could only jump over one of them successfully. And like the whole area <laughs> is just really tight. It is. It, it's. Yeah. It's a place you're going to take a lot of damage blind. For me, in a way. For for sure, yeah. Like I didn't have that much issues with it. But if somebody would have issues with the uh, stage. Um, this is one of those where you have to go all the way to the right first and then yeah. go back all the way to the left at the uh, upper part because that's where the exit is. And it's it's right at the start, the exit, but you have to go through the entire stage. But uh, just like in the previous stage, you can actually make it on top of the <laughs> on top of the roof, I guess. Um, so you can just at the start of the stage jump up uh, the wall, let's call it a wall, uh, and just move a little bit to the right and you drop right next to the exit. So um, you basically skip the entire stage without even having to think about it. So mode cheated. 
Uh, I did not actually. <laughs> I saw it in the speed oh, run because oh, oh. I was uh, I was uh, very curious why it was only so so many minutes. Yeah, <laughs> we'll get into that a little bit speed. later. Yeah, so I, I was like, how did they do that? And then I was like, oh yeah, you basically skipped these two stages completely for starters. Yeah, yeah. Because that, that's probably one of the longest stages of the game, just because you have to backtrack. Yeah. Um, but uh, once you do all that, you know, you do your barrel sequence. This is where the barrel sequences start to get hard, because like these gaps are huge in between each platform now. And the, sometimes the barrels just don't want to cooperate. And another issue with the barrels is with pits, you know, you typically like for things to count as dead in pits, you know, they get, you have to go off the screen. These barrels disappear as soon as like half of them even approach the pit. Like they disappear way too early than they should. <laughs> so sometimes things can get a little, a little sketch in the, in the, in the final screen. But uh, you move on to Rome and this was my favorite set of stages was Rome. Um, I th the mu the mu well you we'll get more into the music, but the music in the stage, the sprite work in the stage, the detailing in the stage was through and through like some of the best I've seen in this game. It was it was the best I saw in in this game. Um, the stage pr represents uh, two platforming stages, a minecart stage. I kind of call I called it the roller coaster. Um, and then we, yeah, we actually it's, have it's a, not, it's outside yeah. this time. Yeah. And then we actually have a boss fight, like an actual boss fight. Um, so I found Rome to be way easier than Egypt, um, until I got to four, three, but the big, my, my, my <laughs> yeah. most tedious part of Rome with all the, sp or all the spike pits in four, one, like four one was just littered with spikes, and like the spikes don't kill you in one hit in this game, like other choice other you know choice other games, but uh, there's a lot of them around, and if you touch the side of a spike, you can you take damage, and like there's no like pit per se, like the spikes are just on the same plane as Asterix is walking on, so if you're not careful, you just walk into the spikes like an idiot. So, um, but fourth four three is brutal so you can only mm -hmm. take you can really only take four hits of damage the fifth hit kills you um and health is scarce to the game like there's a couple of feather pickups in four three but four three they throw everything that they possibly had in this game at you and you were on fall away platforms for most of this stage too. <laughs> like <laughs> you're on fall away platforms. You have to wait for the, for the fire and the oil candles to go back down or up depending on the timing cycle. But remember you're on a fall away platform. So you can't wait too long. All while freaking catapults are shooting fire rocks at you. And Oh my God, it is a mess of a stage. It is hard. <laughs> It sure is, yeah. Compared to the rest, at least, yeah. it's uh, suddenly woo tight platforming. I better learn to how to do this. Like I complained about tight corridors in Egypt, and then I got to four three Rome, and I was like, "Oh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> gotcha." <laughs> My thirty seven lives are now down to like twenty. <laughs> cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then once you get past it, you get put into this boss fight. <laughs> yeah i have a story on this boss fight so any every boss fight like well first of all when i when i got into the screen like i don't know oblix and asterix at all right i i i've i think i watched part of a cartoon for like two minutes once but i didn't yeah. know who oblix really was at all i didn't know who this guy fighting me while well. like, i didn't know anything about what was going on i was like i just thought it was another stage like i was like oh stage four has four mini stages instead of three okay this is cool but no, this was the this was the boss. So I'm sitting there like trying to punch the guy, trying to jump over him. And the screen's not moving, so I'm like, oh, I have to kill this guy to move on. Okay, now it's now it's like cliffhanger. So I'm punching this guy. This guy is just chunking me down. And I die. And I'm like, okay, well, I'll approach him again. And, you know, just jump over his attacks. And I still die because you have to be close to use your punch. I'm mm -hmm. like, you know what? Just spawn me in. I'm just gonna see if I can tank it. And you can just tank the boss. You can punch him <laughs> yep. and tank the boss and you'll be fine. I'm just like, you'll end with no feathers, but you'll be fine. 
And I'm just like, oh, well, that's dumb. And then, like, and then like the floor opens up, and you save Oblix, and that's the end of the game. I'm like, oh, that was a boss fight. <laughs> like, oh, okay. <laughs> so. Yeah, it certainly, like, comes out of nowhere because there are, hasn't been any boss fights in the game, of right. course. But, uh, yeah. And it's a weird fight. Like, you can play it safe, sure, but... Uh, if you go into... Well, maybe you took a little bit too many hits in the stage before, so you wouldn't have your starting health. Uh, but if you have your starting health after, like, dying once against the boss, yeah. you can basically just go in and keep on punching and you will win. So Yeah, I, w I went into my first attempt at it with two feathers, I think, so... Yeah. Oh, yeah, you start with three normally, so... Uh, that's more than enough to just... Just do it. Otherwise, you have to wait. Uh, you punch, you go back. He stabs you. He moves backwards. He throws a net at you. Um, then he uses his spear again, and then he starts moving forward again. So it's a very easy pattern, even oh, okay. if you don't want to want to just tank through it. Yeah, I just tanked through it because that's just, that's yeah. So did I. That's just like <laughs> that's always my approach with like bosses. It's just like I wonder if I can just like face tank the boss and kill it first and if i can't yeah. do it that way then i try to figure out the pattern <laughs> yeah <laughs> in a lot of old games you can just tank bosses so that's always an approach you can take at the start uh but yeah once you once you I, I, is that i'm assuming it's some sort of gladiator right it's not julius caesar that we're fighting at the end it's a gladiator okay, yeah. yeah so once you defeat the gladiator the four Break or like it's not a floor, like there's a trap door, cell door, or something that opens <clears> up. <throat> yeah, you go and save Oblix, and then you have Oblix just like bear hugging this dog. Uh, which I don't know where this dog comes from. I'm assuming it's part of the comic. Yeah, that's their that's their dog. Okay, Eda fix. So you got Oblix bear hugging this poor dog, but uh, then it triggers the credits, which oh, which I, I the credits are actually really cool in this game. Like, it's not just a normal, like, here's a credit song with some scrolling credits or the end. Like, there's actually, like, animate, like, it's it's dark silhouetted, and it's animated of them, like, dancing around a fire, I believe. And in the top yeah. left corner, there's, like, this scroll that opens up, and it tells you, like, everyone that worked on the game. Then it says Finn and everything else at the end. Like, the credit sequence is, it's some of the best best end credit screens that I have seen on a Game Boy, and I've played 300 and some odd Game Boy games. <laughs> yeah, it's based on how all the comics end. They always end with a feast at night uh, in the village, so that's the, okay. the thing they are portraying there. Um, it, it It's kind of a trope in some of the comics, like Asterix is one of them where they always end up with that, and there's a, a Belgian comic uh, named Nero, um, also kind of like the, <laughs> the Roman Emperor Nero, I guess it was, <laughs> uh, but it's, it's not based on that, but his, he, he looks like him and he has like two laurels sticking out of his, his, his ears, <laughs> but, okay. but yeah, that one always ends with uh, them sitting around the table eating waffles because yes, Belgium is the country of waffles, apparently. It's known so, for, known <laughs> for its waffles. Yeah. So that, that it always ends on that. And then you have like, uh. And I always forget, I think Suskin and Wiskin in English is called Bob and Bo Bat. That always ends with, like, a Looney Tunes uh, thing. Um, like, the circles with the face in it, like... Uh, oh, yeah. The... Bob, and, Bob and Bo Bat. Oh, no, it's... Wait, it's um... Susie and something... Uh... Whatever. I, um, I know what I you're talking about, but I can't think of Bob it. Bob and Bobette yeah. is a French name, but it's Susie and something. But um, yeah, that one always ends with like one rectangular square with uh, the with just ant under it. And a bl like it's black with a white circle with her face sticking out. Uh, that That's like how that one ends. It's like a trope used in a lot of comics here that they always end the same way. Now, I, I do know what you're talking about. I can't think of... The, at the end of Looney Tunes, it's Porky the Pig popping out of the center of it. And yeah. Blip, 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 blip. You know, that's all, folks. Type deal. But, uh, yeah, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I don't know the actual, like, name of it here. Um. So, yeah. Quick quick cover art for this, anyway, because it's only one region. 
Um, kind of kind of cool, honestly. Like, it's simple, but it, it gets the job done. The top of the box uh, is just a white band that says Asterix in big red font. It looks like the same font that was used for the comic strip. Um, mm. Yeah. Right below that, big blue, purple, indigo. We'll use indigo. Big indigo colored box with a uh, yellow uh, bam, you know, essentially. If you've watched like the 60s Batman where it says like bam or wham, wherever it has like the spike like explosion outline, kind of like that <clears> with <throat> asterisks in the, in the center of it, drinking one of those strength potions and his mm. feet are clapping a thousand times a, a second there. You know, giving <laughs> yep. him, giving him the, uh, giving him the the vision of like he's starting to like fly a little bit in the air because his his ears are kind of up or his his helmet feathers are kind of up in the uh, up in the air as well too. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a he pretty, lifts off a little bit. Yeah, it's a when, pretty colorful whenever he drinks the thing. Yeah, um, I'm pretty sure it is just. Uh, it's probably a scan from the comics or that they like Asterix is not that hard to draw draw yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean like anybody could do it with a little bit of effort really like I mean you can yeah I mean <laughs> some people would yeah. say no but I think everybody can draw it as if they really try to so um but yeah I'm pretty sure it's just a panel from from one of the comics. It's it's fun to see the infogrames <laughs> armadillo colored yeah. colored in rainbow. Because I yeah. don't I can't recall too many times I've seen the armadillo actually colored. I I can always recall it as just a black armadillo. Oh no! Well, yeah, I'm used to this one because yeah, like these games came out in Europe only, so yeah. I've always seen it. Of course, uh, it's fun. It's also fun to see your Nintendo seal of approval be a circle and not an oval. Um, <laughs> True, yeah. 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 For those that don't know, the Nintendo seal of approval is different in America than it is in Europe. In Europe, it's a full-on circle. In America, it's an oval. I don't remember what it is in Japan. Let me pull up a J Japanese box. <clears throat> um, this one shouldn't have been approved by Nintendo, but what about this uh, one? I don't think they have one. Yeah, no, they like don't. Like, I'm looking at the Ninja Gun one, they don't have one, so... Yeah, I'm looking at Legend of the River King right now. Yeah, they don't have an actual, like, seal of approval, because everything in Japan was just so damn good that they didn't need one. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It just yeah, says on the back, it, licensed so. by Nintendo, with some Japanese nah. stuff that I can't read. So, yeah, if you guys didn't know, if y'all didn't know that... Europe and American uh, seal of approvals were were different. I think ours were a weird a, a weird version of a gold as well too, because our our gold is ugly on our boxes. Uh, that I can't like really say. Then I would have to find the box here yeah, I, and I not a scan because some of the the colors on the scans are that's fair, totally yeah. wrong anyway. So I, ha I have the the humans over here next to me a box of it, and I was like, wow, that gold is atrociously ugly. But it, it could be <laughs> yeah, it could be old as well too. Who knows? Yeah. But um, trivia general reception. I'm assuming this game was probably fairly well received in Europe. I would assume so as well. Like everybody I knew had this game or one of the other iterations of this game. So uh, yeah, the, these were always very popular yeah. here. Um, but yeah, back then. Sadly, all these things weren't that popular overseas yet, so they never got a release outside of Europe. Um, <clears throat> even though they tried, but uh, in the end, they were like, yeah, let, let's just not do that because nobody knows who this is. <laughs> well, no, one, yeah. no one knows European history outside of Europe. <laughs> <laughs> that as well, yeah. And yeah, the characters were just not that popular, popular yet, I think. When it comes to Asterix, um, it probably got a little bit more popular in um, America after the uh, live-action movies came out, and that was in 2000, I believe. Yeah, so very later on, yeah. Yeah. Well, our, so that's our, seven years between. So. Yeah, it's, it's a long time. But, uh, yeah, with that, we're going to take a short break uh, when we come back. Uh 
Mo will talk about his um, sweet interview with uh, Mr. Gonzalez. So, with that, uh, stay tuned. Welcome back, everybody. So, Mo, you had the experience to interview Mr. Gonzalez about uh, his composition work, not only just for Asterix itself, but for a lot of the games that he did for <coughs> Game Boy. Um, you want to want to tell us about your interview? Yeah, I um, I composed a few uh, questions that are not super completely tied to just Asterix itself, but uh, also a little bit more in general because he was able to work on like all these uh, amazing Game Boy conversions of uh, the these comics. And um, <clears throat> so I wanted to just ask some things in general as well. So um, we'll be going over these uh, I guess, and, and talk a little bit about them. So um, <clears throat> the first thing that uh, I asked was, um, Asterix was both developed for NES and Game Boy uh, by bit managers. Um, the Super Nintendo version was actually not made by them. Um, it has some similarities between the games, but um, they were made by a completely different team. Maybe Infogrames itself, I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, the soundtracks uh, share some altered compositions uh, and have a few unique tracks to them as well. So I asked, would you work on these compositions simultaneously or uh, finish up one and then rearrange it for another system? Um, I thought that was an interesting question because, yeah, if you're working on the same game for two systems, it's, it's uh, yeah, interesting how you would uh, do something like that. Um, so Gonzalez, uh, <clears throat> his answer was, we actually did the Game Boy version first, and when that was finished, the NES version. Um, and that was surprising to me, um, because mostly people think that Game Boys are ports of their console uh, counterparts. So it, it was really interesting that they actually completed the Game Boy version first and then the NES version. Um, <clears throat> both consoles uh, sound very differently. Um, so he came up with new tracks for the NES version uh, to make best use of its unique sound capabilities. Yeah, I've never played the NES version, so I, I don't know what the uh, what the, the music is. But yeah, just hearing that they did Game Boy before NES is... It's very, you know, out in left field because most, like you said, most people just pull from their, their their console counterpart and then the music is ported over and then crushed basically for the computer or mm -hmm. for the Game Boy mm -hmm. chip. So, yeah, uh, I do know a little bit uh, with, with these later questions as well, um, how that actually came to be. And it's, it's actually pretty simple. Um most European video game companies uh, actually started on the ZX Spectrum. Um, and I think the ZX Spectrum was European only, right? I have the no console, idea. Well, console, computer. I think it, it was a, just a European thing. Um, but the hardware of the ZX Spectrum and the Game Boy are actually very, very, very close together. Um, and that's why these companies from Europe uh, were so fast in adapting their programming to the Game Boy system, um, which is maybe something we can dive into a little bit with a light episode or, or something like that. But um, just having made so many games for ZX Spectrum, and that was the same with bit managers, 
um, with their other company. They actually worked on games for that. So it was very easy for them to pick up making games for the Game Boy. Yeah, just a quick look up. Uh, ZX Spectrum was released in the United Kingdom in 1982. So Yeah, so that was only only a European and maybe even only a UK uh, quote-unquote console. So. But yeah, that, that's where that comes from. So it makes sense that they would go with Game Boy first before actually uh, going into NES. Um, and I did play the NES version uh, yesterday. Uh, it's the same game. Um, you just see more on the screen, uh, which of course helps with not only seeing where the projectiles are coming from way in advance, but uh, yeah, also that bonus game that I found out by uh, playing the NES version, actually. I wonder how the SNES <laughs> game is since it wasn't made by Bitmanager. No, it was not. Yeah, I wonder how it is, though, since it's... A completely different team. Um, it's well, it's actually the. I'll come back to that later, but I did play that again yesterday as well. Um, it's a completely different game, but you can see that they looked at the Game Boy and the NES game uh, to get some ideas out of that at least. Gotcha. But it's it, it plays differently. You know? Huh. <clears throat> So yeah, that was uh, the first question, and then um, I asked, like, I remember you releasing some old self-made software for composing Game Boy music on uh, the Twitter account, on his Twitter account. Um, it's like, a, yeah, some software he made just for Game Boy, and he released it to the public so everybody can use it. Uh, so I asked if it was already being used uh, for Asterix, and if not, uh, what did he actually use for the... For the music so um <clears throat> so uh gonzalez answered uh, for composing the music of asterix i used my old zx spectrum tracker there we go zx spectrum again uh to create the basic idea for the tunes but the big work came later when i coded the music in assembler i think is it assembly or assembler for co i don't know i don't know assembly is the code used to it's make game the language, games right yeah yeah, yeah, so, yeah, probably that. So, adding all the details, noises, and final sounds for it. Many times the starting ideas differed a lot from the final results. Nothing is definitive when I start working on a track, and it may change a lot during its development. That's pretty cool. <clears throat> yeah, I like asking specific composition questions like this, because... A lot of people don't really realize how these things got made back in the day. So, yeah. um, and again, if just follow uh, Gonzalez's Twitter account, he constantly posts things about how he made uh, old music and things like that. And uh, like this software, just releasing to the public, so so that people can actually use it themselves. So it's always uh, really cool. I'm. I'll look up his Twitter handle in a bit. I don't remember it. The actual heart. mindset, too, of, like, his work isn't finished until, like, development is finished is interesting, too, because I wonder how many composers approach this. Because, like, when you're developing a game, like, how often are you changing, like, your level layouts or your sprites or, like, the theme of the stage or things like that? <laughs> so, like, you always have to, like, like, you can't just have, like, here's... 10 tracks to choose from fit them in where you think they, they fit in right like i'm sure some people have done that you know so uh, you, you know I'm, I'm sure there are games out there it's like hey here's a pool of of game boy songs like grab them and pulling them in wherever you wherever you seem fit but like having having it be like it's not definitive until like the actual development is done is super cool because they can just cater that composition to the actual stage itself, like whether if it's going to be a fast paced stage, a slow paced stage, or if it's an ice stage, water stage, wherever it may be, it's actually a really interesting mindset to have through that. So I'd be curious to see, like, yeah. I'd be curious to know, like, how many iterations of these songs he went through before, like, the final iteration was, you know, there for us. Yeah, yeah, the next question definitely ties into that a little bit more. Um, but yeah, if you can definitely immediately hear when you're playing any game, not only on Game Boy, um, if the composer actually took time to dive into what the game actually is about, or that he just he or she just got asked to make a soundtrack and they just 
put it anywhere they really wanted to place it. Um, so yeah, as uh, as Gonzalez was part of the development team for this company, um, he always, of course, knew. Uh, what was going on and so making a composition on that basis is a lot more intricate and also it, it, it just comes over uh, way better when you're playing the game instead of just somebody making some songs which have nothing to do with with the game so yep. yeah but yeah the so the next question was um, your compositions for this game and other Belgium Franco comic book adaptations uh, seem to really capture the spirit of the source material like if you're listening to the Asterix soundtrack you can imagine it being completely tied to Asterix like it just fits and, and the same goes with like Smurfs or, or uh, Tintin or Lucky Luke so um, did you dive in the comics before making them, or did you mostly get inspired by the environments of the levels where the game takes place? So that, that was my uh, question. So um, Gonzalez answered, uh, I have always been a big fan of these comics, and I own a complete collection of both Tintin and Asterix, even the latest albums. Um, latest albums like Asterix stopped after both of them died but then somebody else picked them up and I think there have been two new releases since then um but there are only like 39 in total or something and Tintin doesn't have new ones anymore but they released like one that was lost for a few years or something like that just to oh, that's cool. uh, dive a little bit into that um that said i don't recall being specially careful on making the music suit a game as it would fit in a movie i just tight uh tried excuse me i just tried to make something that would be cool to listen to on the console but inspired by the environment and the characters i wanted to get a wow i didn't know my console could sound like that feeling from the players and become proud of what their console could do he achieved it for sure. Like the soundtrack for this game is very, very good. Yeah, and he uses that uh, set of mind for all the soundtracks he has made, and that's why everybody just knows them immediately. Like it, it's just a, such a specific style of music that you yeah. can just immediately recognize it, and uh, it makes the game so much better. It it makes a game more memorable because like i'm thinking back because i've played the smurfs i've played tintin and like tintin to me like as the game itself isn't memorable but the music of it made that game memorable same with the smurfs like i can recall one stage of smurfs and that's it <laughs> but like the smurfs the reason i keep the reason I, I know smurfs so well in my head is because the the, the sound effects and the music of that game was very good so it, it can help make a mediocre game or a, a unmemorable game very memorable. So Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for me it's a little bit different with these games because I do have like this connection to them yeah. because I grew up with all these comics and I love these comics, except for Asterix actually, but uh yeah, like for me, it's it's a little bit different, but for people who don't really know the characters or what they're about, and uh, so the games are not that important, I guess, to them. But uh, if you have such a great soundtrack uh, that goes with it, at, at least you can enjoy it uh, on a level you wouldn't otherwise if it didn't have that uh, that soundtrack tied to it. Yeah, for sure. Like I, I. I, I knew this, like, growing up, I didn't know Asterix or Tintin growing up. I knew the Smurfs because of the cartoon, Saturday morning or whatever it was. Like, I knew the Smurfs. I actually didn't know the Smurfs had a comic until very recently. So, even when I played the Smurfs, like, I, whenever I would watch the Smurfs, I was like, I, who would ever want to make a video game about the Smurfs? Like, who cares? <laughs> you know? But, like, it's, it's just interesting to think about, like, how like the different like cult or like cultures regions you know or, you know like most that he's super tied to all these he has a history with them and then you have me who has only watched like two minutes of an asterisk cartoon you know this thing has been around for 60 years you know so mm -hmm. it's it's interesting just to hear like all of this like come up and like just have like the two different cultures just kind of like yeah, this is whatever, and the other one, like, yeah, I grew up with this, like, this is awesome. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah. 
So um, if going from that previous question, I also asked, uh, do you actually read some of these comics yourself in your own free time? And if so, which one is your favorite? So we kind of already answered that in, in the previous question. So he's a big fan of all these comics, um, but he's not sure if he has a favorite. Um, they are so different that it's hard to choose. Um, I like each of them for very different reasons and none of them can replace the others. But yeah, Tintin and Asterix definitely are his most read favorite, I guess, out of them, as he has uh, both the entire collections of those. Um, for me, it's Spirou. Like, that is my favorite one. Uh, I like Tintin, but I don't have all of them. Um, and Asterix, I only have one, I believe, so... But yeah, it's nice that they found a... Uh, by that Infogrames... Uh, could find a studio to make these games with somebody who actually had a lot of uh, uh, familiarity with the source material um, and not just somebody who had to make a game just because. Uh. Yeah, I've never read any of these comics. Like I said, I didn't even know some of these comics existed. I didn't even yeah. know Spiru was influenced by a comic at all, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, that just shows why these games never got a release outside of I don't Europe. even know what Lucky so. Luke is, so... <laughs> oh, yeah, he's just a cowboy. But <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's, well. <laughs> that's, that's basically the entire plot of it. He's a cowboy in, in, the, in the Old West. Well, he would have well. fit in fine in America. It, yeah, I think it's it might have been the first that got uh, popular in America. Actually, <laughs> well, <laughs> I wonder why. I know I know Cool Hand Luke. I don't know Lucky Luke though. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. So moving on, I, I went back to some more serious questions again. I guess. Um, so did you already know during the development of Asterix that bit managers would be able to work on the other games like Tintin, Smurfs, Lucky Luke, and Spirou in the future? Um, so here's a Gonzalez's answer. Uh, no, how could we have anticipated such a thing? Asterix was made during a very difficult time between the end of New Frontier, so the, the former company, and the founding of Bit Managers. It was actually Asterix which allowed us to fund Bit Managers and start working more as a serious game company. And I, I love this answer. Yeah. <laughs> like, that is such cool information to have. Asterix literally made bit managers possible. Oh, that's really cool. And then, yeah, Infogrames, or Infogram, as you pronounce it, saw our potential, and we had always had a great relationship with them until their final days. So, yeah, um, they were very impressed with Asterix, and then they just uh, kept bit managers on for all the other games, except for the Super Nintendo ones, I guess. It's interesting. Like it's like it sucks that some that 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 the hardship had to happen, right? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. I remember my interview with with uh, Chase. It was you know he had five four or five weeks to develop Alien Three, right? Yeah. Um, you know, in like in that time, like he's telling you know he's telling us how stressful it was, like this that the oh I, we forgot to do this, so we had to hurry up and add it in. Like the final queen fight of Alien Three is yeah. sorry, but not very good, <laughs> you know. And <laughs> uh, you know, but it's just he's like, yeah, we didn't, you know, we forgot to add a final boss, and that's why the fights like that. It's like, oh, okay, well, yeah, five weeks, and you get five weeks to develop a game. It, it's tough. Like it sucks that this hardship happens, you know, with such great people, like great composers, great developers. But uh, it's interesting to hear some of this because, like, this is a big, big pain point in today's game industry, right? Like, we hear about some of the some of the hell, you know, s situations that people are put in. Whether it's hey, we need to put eighty hours a week of work into getting this game out on time. So you can't have any time for yourself or your family to, hey, you know, we're not going to delay this game, so better get at it to, hey, we're going to delay this game once because it quote-unquote wasn't ready, 
but now you really need to push in more time or hey like thanks for releasing this game now by the way you're fired you know like the game industry is is rough still to this day in 2020 Mm -hmm. you know it i'm sure some things have bettered themselves since the 1980s but overall like the same pain points that were from the 80s and 90s is still happening in today's world which sucks but it's 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 interesting to hear like the, the story of how a development you know team or company production team company excuse me company or single people you know like Gonzalez David Wise whomever you know rose from those ashes you know came to that you know came to that head of stress and was and ended up releasing some of the some of the best video games of our childhood, you know, and some memorable games of our childhood even too. So even though like the, the condition sucked, like it's always impressive to hear like how it all kind of worked out in the end. Yeah. Uh, I will always remember when Grant Kirkhope, uh, and I, I, either he was on Game Grumps or either he was on, uh, Super Beer Bros, but uh, <clears throat> when they were playing Banjo Kazooie, and it was like, you know, when we were making these games, Nintendo had to listen to us uh, because <laughs> if it wasn't finished, we just wanted to finish it, and they had to listen to us. And then, like two or three years later, it was the complete uh, other way well, around, yeah. where <laughs> where we had to finish something and we didn't have enough time for it. So. Um, some things remain to say, some things uh, changed in the complete opposite direction when it comes to uh, developing or making games. Um, will it ever be really good? I don't think so, because, well, I... it's just it's just a world we live in where, where money is the most important yeah. thing. Uh, so, I, I mean, yeah. Like, going off on a little bit of a tangent on this, sorry, Gonzalez, if you do listen to this episode... But, uh, <laughs> like, a little bit of a tangent, like, we think back, like, think back in the late 80s, early 90s, like, we never got, like, actual release days for video games, right? Nope. We knew, we had an idea of when it was potentially going to be released, but we never got, like, specific, like, July 14th, Alien 3, Super Nintendo, Be There, Be Square type deal, like, we never got that, we always we knew like the release day like maybe like a couple weeks in advance because like that's when the game was going to be done. Like we always had like the quarter one, quarter two release, you know, quarter one, quarter two, nineteen ninety three, or in nineteen ninety three expect this game. Like we never had those dates, but as we've progressed as you know a gaming community and the gaming culture has evolved to what it is today. People have put all this type of, I, I honestly say, arbitrary stress on themselves to get a game out in a certain amount of time so they can reap the benefits of money. Um, like I, I'll use cyber, like Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven right now is the is the biggest prime example of this, right? Mm-hmm. Cyberpunk was delayed three, four times, you know, and because the game just quote unquote wasn't ready yet. And then they decide, hey, on December 10th of 2020, we're going to release this game for PS4, PS5, Xbox, PC. And the game <laughs> releases, and the game is bad on PS4 and original Xboxes, but playable on PS5, new Xboxes, and PC. Mm-hmm. You know, So like, kudos to them for pushing out the game to not kill their staff. But also at the same time, they put all of this stress on themselves to get this game out on December 10th because they've quote unquote, you know, delayed the game so much. Like we look at Death Stranding for an example, right? Like Hideo was like, hey, the game's being made, the game will be out when it'll be out. Yeah. You know, he didn't give us any release dates at all until he was confident of when that game was going to be ready. You know, like how many trailers of Death Stranding did we watch at Game Show Awards, at E3, <laughs> at, you know, whatever else, you know, that came out for gaming related culture? Like, how we've watched a lot of Death Stranding trailers and they were all slightly different, but none of them ever gave us a year of release or a day of release. It was always coming soon, right? So, 
like maybe maybe it's time to take that mindset back again and be like, hey, like maybe we don't need a new Assassin's Creed every year. Maybe we don't need a new Smash Brothers every five years, you know, like maybe we take a step back and not put our actual like due dates in and destroy our staff. Like, I don't know. Like, I, I feel like there are steps to be made, but with gaming culture and how much money there is in gaming right now, I feel like that taking that step back is just not going to happen anytime soon. Yeah, I don't think so either uh, at all. And then something else to think about, like, um, you can see the difference between a company that makes its own game and a company that has to work for another publisher, yeah. basically. Um, like, that Stranding, Kojima did it all on its own. It's his studio. He decides right. uh, whatever he wants to do. Well, if like you Metal look Gear at the 5, final yeah. Metal Gear, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> which was for Konami, it's never it never got finished because they they wouldn't let him. Okay, he did uh, <laughs> squander the budget a little bit here and there, which I I understand is not cool, but. Uh, but yeah, that, that, that's one problem. And that's why indie developers are so uh, popular right now yeah. because they make the game in their time and it's done when it's done and they just do it for themselves. So th that's always a good thing. Um, something to keep in mind though, which started back in the 80s, I guess, up until this point, are uh, games that are tied to movies or, or something like that. Um in case uh, of Alien 3, for example, it had to come out the same time as the movie came out in the theaters. So then you get that crunch of five weeks to... to... They could have contacted them way earlier, of course, but right. um, yeah. those are the, those time constraints that, that are tied to that when... Um, it's, it's the same with all these games, uh, True Lies or uh, Cliffhanger or all these other games we have talked about in the past that are tied to a movie, they have to be done when the movie comes out because otherwise nobody will know what these games are even. Don't forget um, about so it. it yeah. yeah, it's it's all just promotional basically to get... These games are made to promote a movie. So it's for more sales from the movie and not so much the game, right. but so they have to be released in time. And you could make the same argument, but Asterix is also something... Uh, that is tied to like a movie or a comic. Yeah, but this was already established back in the 60s and this game wasn't made to tie in with anything from the Asterix uh, library. It was made to show off what Asterix was really and to celebrate it, um, which gives you a, a, a bigger time to actually make a game in. So, uh, but yeah, still to, to this day, um, everything that is tied into something has to be released and usually, usually it is a very poor yeah. game because of that. Yeah. No, yeah, that was the, <laughs> no, that was the tangent, the tangent about that, the I guess. Right <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, where did I leave off? Oh yeah. Um, so then just a general question. Question, yeah. Uh, question I ask is, uh, out of all the soundtracks you composed for these uh, comic book adaptations, which one would be your favorite? Um, so Gonzalo said, that's a very hard question to answer as they are very different kind of soundtracks. Um, so I'm not sure. I composed five, five soundtracks for Asterix games alone. Um, so it has to come up first, but the Smurfs have always triggered something special uh, within me since I have great memories of reading the comics when I was a kid. So not a real answer, but <laughs> doesn't matter. So he, he definitely likes the Asterix and Smurfs soundtrack a lot. Uh, moving on from that, I actually asked some general questions, not really tied to... Uh, oh, just one question. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, just... <laughs> yeah, basically just one question uh, that I had. Um, so, with the recent release of Game Boy Studio, new Game Boy titles are being made. Uh, and a lot of people are doing that. I talked about this 
in another episode. It's really cool to see uh, yeah. what they're doing. Uh, do you have any tips for the people composing music for these projects? Uh, well, I can only say just try to make some memorable music. Don't be afraid to experiment. A console with so many limitations is actually a really good machine to explore and try to get the most out of it. Um, I'm not a composer myself, I'm not a musician in any way, uh, so I don't know the drive behind uh, making music myself, but uh, I think that is definitely something to take to heart for about anything you want to do. Uh, just limitations are always, well, not always, but usually a good thing because you try to find ways to abuse those limitations to actually create something fantastic. Um, so yeah, I think that is a very, very good uh, recommendation from Gonzalez for sure. Yeah, and then the, the final thing I quote unquote asked was, uh, do you have any any other information you would like to share about Asterix or something else uh, that that you would like us to share with uh, with our audience? Um, and uh, the reply was, it was great to work on so many soundtracks for the Asterix franchise, and it never ceases to amaze me that people actually still remember the game and the music to this day. Uh, I never thought that someone could contact me in the future to ask me questions about it, so it's greatly appreciated. And he also wishes everybody a great and safe uh, Christmas and other holidays. True. But yeah, that's... Uh, we are also amazed that we can contact some of these people sometimes and that they are uh, willing to take their time to answer some questions yeah. about this uh, without any strings attached at all. Um, it's... Uh, yeah. We, we heard from Man Over Mars uh, that uh, we could contact Gonzales maybe uh, because they did for, for pixelated audio back in, the, <laughs> back in the days for the Lukey Luke episode, I believe it was. Um, but I'm always kind of scared to <laughs> just out of the blue ask something from somebody. Ooh, can't uh, confirm. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Like, I, I'm never too comfortable with that, but uh, yeah, it's it's amazing that we were able to get so many answers. Um, so again, um, I said it in, in our uh, personal messages as well. Thank you very much, uh, Alberto, for taking a little bit of your time, uh, because you are busy, to, to answer these questions and to uh, inform people who are listening to this episode and might be interested in... Uh, hearing some more behind the scenes stuff that's going on. So yeah, thank you very, very much. Yeah, if you want to uh, follow uh, Alberto Gonzalez, his Twitter handle is at Alberto, A-L-B-E-R-T-O, underscore McCalby, M-C-A-L-B-Y. Um, he also has a SoundCloud, uh, Joe McCalby, as well too, where he has some uh, some music going on, it looks like, so... Uh, go give him a follow. Go, you know, go check out his work. He's a fantastic composer. Um, made made great music. Obviously, made great music. We're talking about him, you know. So uh, <laughs> made memorable childhood game music. You know that Mo and I grew up well, more Mo than I grew up with. But uh, as a fellow retro gamer, I definitely respect you know everything that he's done, having played most of his games at this point um very a very talented individual so but uh yeah just to touch base on on what Mo said earlier like it's it it it's a little intimidating like some of these you know some of the composers and producers and whatnot may may just see themselves as the normal human being of you know the world but like in our eyes like these people like made our childhoods basically right so it's it's a little intimidating to approach them at first like i you know mo was you know messaging me like how do i do this because i i i had experience reaching out to 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 <clears throat> jace you know about alien 3 so i was trying to give him some pointers on how to approach you know mr gonzalez and i was like i'm like <laughs> i'm like 
at the end of it, I was like, you just got to go for it. Like, the worst thing that they can do is just ignore you <laughs> or tell you no, you know. So, but you just, you just got to yeah. go for it. But it, it's really cool that, you know, they take the time out of their super busy lives. And especially now, like, 2020 has not been easy for anyone, period. Just, like, taking the time out of their lives, taking the time, you know, out of their work schedule or whatever it may be just to answer a few questions that we have about their games and just like the, the actual like natural excitement that they have answering these questions because, you know, like they probably don't get, you know, they, they nowadays they probably get to talk about it a lot because, you know, we have a plot, we have platforms to reach out to them for, but like pre Twitter days, like the only way to contact these people were to like find an email address and email them or somehow get a hold of like a company that they worked for and, you know, talk to them through, through a phone interview. So like, all this information was kind of vaulted up up until, you know, social media kind of made its presence. And even though social media mostly is a curse at times, it can be used for some really good things. So it's 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 nice to have like a genuine answer coming from people that are generally interested in their in their their trade of field and, you know, having us, you know, like Mo, myself, you know, and plenty of other retro you know, archivists and gamers out there reach out to them and just ask them, just like, hey, like, what what inspired you to do this? You know, like, having us, you know, the gamers themselves, the childhood that we grew up with, you know, generally being excited to reach out to one of our quote-unquote childhood heroes that made this game, you know, that we absolutely adored. So it's it's kind of a two-way street, but at the same time, like, the two-way street is well well-paved, well-painted, and no obstacles at all in the way. So it's, it's actually super cool. And I, and I, I'm thankful every time that, you know, Jason and I actually have a conversation on Twitter. I'm always, you know, appreciative of any insight that he has to give. And yeah, I don't, it's a super cool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm sure like, uh, people get asked a lot to do some interviews with like very popular, very well established podcasts or magazines or, or uh, things like that. But we're still a very small podcast yeah. to be honest, like with a very small audience and it, it's not like half the world knows who we are or something like that. So we are still basically doing this from a fanboy perspective oh, yeah, <laughs> and, and not so much as a, as a professional perspective so it's it's always at least for me weird to reach out to actual yeah. professional people uh wanting to to ask so some questions but uh yeah i hope i did it professionally a love a love <laughs> see this is how professional i am i can't even talk on mic <laughs> but yeah i i think i did it uh well enough because i'm not that much of an interview person either but uh i, I think i uh collected the correct information that would be interesting for anybody listening at least and not going with uh, the the really silly questions like just how did you make this <laughs> how did it go did you get paid right, lot? like yeah. some not something like that but like actually diving a little bit deeper into it so yeah and we hope to do this more in the future maybe we'll do another gonzalez episode we in definitely the future. have some more jason um, episodes coming and that as well yeah or anybody else uh and if maybe somebody's even listening to the podcast uh, who worked on a game like just you can always also reach out to us i guess like would be it's always nice to to hear even, some thoughts from uh, the people even if you're not like a triple a developer composer or anything else like if you're doing <laughs> something in like game boy studios and like you want to talk about your experience like i would be open to having you on a, even a light episode you know just to hear like just to yeah. hear your yeah, experience like, uh, of making a game boy game composing them creating the graphics like i'm not tying i'm not tying this down to triple a titles so yeah, yeah, like I did with yeah. the Daddy's episode with Isma. Like I, I just reached out, like, hey, can I, can I ask you a few questions about this game? And sure enough, oh. um, <clears throat> we can quickly go over this next part before we take a break because that was a lot to go over. Yeah. Um, 
I'm going to start with you because your voice is still warmed up and I know you, you love talking so much. Um, you've already given <laughs> a lot of thoughts in history, or at least a lot of history, um, with Asterix itself, but uh, I'm, I'm sure you have more to go along with that. Yeah, a little bit. So, um, with this game in particularly, I don't have a history. Um, the very first version of this game that I played was the Super Nintendo one because a friend had it and I, I borrowed it a little bit. Um, and like I said before, that was not a port, but actually like a, not a completely different game, but like different enough. So so it doesn't resemble the Game Boy or NES versions at all. Um, and I'm also pretty sure that on Game Boy, I played Asterix and Obelix way before I played uh, this version. So... Um, when I think about the Asterix games, my mind usually goes back to uh, either one of those. Um, and like I said, Asterix is definitely not one of my favorite comics. But that's mostly because when I was a kid, I probably didn't really get these comics as well as I would today. Uh, because I've read that one that I have now, and it's actually really good, but it, it just didn't click with me. Uh, mostly because history was boring as a kid, like I didn't like history at all, so the setting was already not for me. Um, uh, the stereotypes I did not know about yet because I was too young to have been familiarized with those stereotypes of, uh, of different people. And um, it also highly, highly, highly... Um, works with puns constantly basically um and i was a little bit too young to get those puns because the name asterix is already a pun on asterisk um obelix is obelisk which is one of those big stone thingies um you get panoramics because of a pun <laughs> like i mean it, it's all puns basically this entire series and i just didn't get that so um yeah i didn't get into the comics but i really did enjoy the live action movies and i would recommend everybody to watch those uh they're so good they're french sorry <laughs> if you don't like french like i don't like french either but uh yeah those movies are, are just great and the guy who plays obelix is uh a Belgian actor, actually. Uh, I think that all the rest are uh, are French actors, but that one at least is a uh, is a Belgian actor. Uh, but the very first Asterix game I ever played was actually the arcade game made by Konami, because uh, that was one of the few games that that was at the carnival here in uh, in my town. So that one I do remember a lot. I actually played through that again yesterday. Because I could never get very far in that game. And I know why now. Probably because they put it on uh, super hard. Because <laughs> how else would they make money in arcades? Uh, but I actually but I actually put it on very easy. Uh, in the emulator. The MAME emulator. And even then it was still a very unfair game. Um, it's, it's not really well made in my opinion well the fighting not the, the rest of the game is pretty well um and to this day um whenever panacea which is uh the girl in the in the asterix series shows up in that game she makes this sound and i can't reproduce it uh so i'm not even gonna try to but to this day um the sound she makes is still stuck in my head because she's on screen a long time and she keeps repeating it. And even when the demo is playing in the background, if you're doing something else, she shows up. Um, so yeah, Lex, I will try to give you the clip on that so you can put it in right here. And that is the... <laughs> I just can't get it out of my head. Like, it, it will remain there forever. <laughs> um, my only exposure to this game prior to this episode was, like I said, the two minutes of the, of the cartoon that I watched. And I didn't... Un As an American, I did not understand anything that was happening in those two minutes of that cartoon. <laughs> I should go back and rewatch. Knowing what I know now, I should go back and rewatch it, at least more than two minutes of it, to see if I can really understand what's happening. 
But uh, the only exposure I had to it before that was I watched uh, Gron and Hero play Asterix and Obelix for Project Game Boy. Um, but outside of that, like I knew Asterix, I knew Asterix uh, existed. Like I knew, I knew of of it. I didn't know what it was per se, but I I knew of it. Um, but I play I played Asterix for the first time for this episode. And was actually pretty surprised at how how much I actually enjoyed the game itself. Uh, I do want to go and play Asterix mm-hmm. and Obelix now, um, just to see like how much how much you know the game evolved because you know it did come out later. Um, but like I like having played previous, <laughs> I'll call them info game games. You know, like I played Tintin. Uh, and the the sun god or whatever the heck is called, and I played the Smurfs, and then I played mm-hmm. Asterix, and like honestly, like Asterix played the best out of the out of all the ones I've played so far. So I I didn't have like a lot of I didn't have high high hopes. Like the other two games were good, like they weren't amazing, but they were good. So I didn't have like crazy high hopes, but like I had I had a I had a bar that was set for them. But the the game actually exceeded the bar because I just thought it was very it was just well done and the, and the music was phenomenal, but um, yeah, I outside that I have zero history about the, about Asterix, so <laughs> being American and all, yeah. Um, speed run segment, very short speed game. It's six and a half minutes by Al Alos Alos on easy difficulty. Almost, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, like I mentioned before, you can you basically skip two stages uh, already, uh, and the rest of the yeah. stages are relatively short. So yeah, when I saw how short the speed run of it was, I was just like, "Excuse me," because the game took me like an hour and a half to beat, and I was just like, "Excuse me, six and a half minutes." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's the same with the Smurf speed run, um, like. That game is only like half an hour casually or something. The speedrun is like nine minutes. Um, but I would recommend this one before the Smurfs because the Smurf suffers from one the thing. Swamp level. The swamp <laughs> level. <laughs> uh, like even the speedrunners of that game are like, this is the worst thing ever uh, to do quickly. So yeah. So this is like a very, very easy one to get the into. Swamp for sure. stage is brutal. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I mean, with that, uh, like I said, we're not a speed running podcast. Go. There's there's others out there. Um. Hmm. So with that, we're gonna take another short break. When we come back, we're gonna talk about community events that are happening. Uh, any questions that may have been asked? I have no idea. I haven't looked at Discord in a while, and of course, you know all the other outro nonsense that we throw at you. So stay tuned. Welcome back, everybody. So, uh, community events. So, we're end of the year now. So, marathons now are pretty much on pause. Because holiday season, you know, no one wants to do a marathon over Christmas. Uh, even if it, even if it is 2020. Uh, really, the only big marathon happening is going to be uh, AGDQ 2021. Which is going to be virtual again this, um, I guess not this year, next year. This time around, there we go. Yeah. Um, well, this is this episode is in two thousand twenty one anyway. So yes, this, this year. year. <laughs> there we go. It'll be it'll be this year. Um. So just looking at the schedule, quick. A lot of GBA games, oddly enough, but uh, we do have obviously Link's Awakening DX. Um. Yep, Link's Awakening DX. Oh, here we go. Here we go. <laughs> um, Pokemon Blue, of as you do. Super no. Mario Land 2, featuring Adam, I Adam why. Ferrari 64, our boy Odeer, 
and EIP. And then after that, are you ready for it? Are you are you ready? Super Mario Land 3 by oh. Black SR. Oh, that's that's actually nice to get that. And get ready for once. this. It ain't it ain't over yet. Are you ready? Wario oh. Land 4. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Less excited because yeah, that's the one Wario Land game I do really like. But no, the speed run. That'd be ran cool. by Mr. That's... Shasta. So yeah, um, yeah, of course. Mario Land Two is any percent glitchless. Wario Land or Mar- Wario Land One. Yeah, I mean that's what it actually is. Is any percent by Black yeah. and then normal any percent simplest Wario Land Four by Mr. Shasta. Uh, like I said, we have Link's Awakening DX. No wrong warp. Uh, that's going to be on Tazbot as well too, so that's going to be an interesting hmm, okay. watch as well. Um, the Pokemon Blue is, you guessed it, the quote unquote right now closer of AGDQ. Um, there is a huh. bonus game after it for Ocarina Time All Dungeons GameCube, but. The the oh, real yeah. quote unquote finale game that's on the schedule is Pokemon Blue. Catch them all. <laughs> that is actually that's weird, crazy. Yeah, sure. Crazy. <laughs> what a world we live in where a Game Boy game closes a GDQ. Um, yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. I mean, this is, I'm looking at the restream schedule, but I'm assuming it's the same as regular GDQ, right? I would assume I'll so. Yeah. yeah, Pokemon Blue is the "quote unquote" scheduled closer. That's great. That's insane. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> to think that a Game Boy game is gonna close a GDQ. Like we all know that <laughs> All Creative Time is gonna get met because ZFG is running it, and it's GDQ. Everything gets mm-hmm. met. But I mean, like, the actual scheduled closure is. Pokemon Blue. Oh, let's hope it doesn't get Mercy killed like all the other Pokemon games that get ran. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but that's all. That's all we got for marathons. Marathon won't. Marathons really won't start picking back up again until like March, April time frame. So yeah. Um, <laughs> listen, listener questions. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we got one question <laughs> from Legs. <laughs> yes, our producer Legs. <laughs> uh, I was not gonna put it in, but I was like, uh, whatever, I'll just do it anyway. So, <laughs> her question is completely related to Asterix, of course. How come in Japan they always use Asterisks to draw cartoon buttholes <laughs> on cats? I mean, to be fair, it's not just limited <laughs> to cats. Like, if you watch most most cartoons that feature a butthole, it's typically in yep. asterisks. Yep. Uh, yes, like, same here in Belgium. Like, cartoons, comics, whatever drawing <laughs> that is crudely done... As an asterisk for a butthole. <laughs> Legs literally just made a PG podcast into PG-13 with one question. I hope you're happy with yourself. <laughs> yeah. And and we're yeah, going to get blamed for it. We're the ones going to get like, yelled at. Yeah. We're the ones talking about it. <laughs> uh, what a question. Yeah, I don't know. Because buttholes <laughs> looks like asterisks. True. I mean, like, that's, the, that's the only reason. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought we'd ever get a question like that on this podcast? Mad, matter of time, yeah. honestly. <laughs> yeah. And this is the this is the episode where Gonzalez answers so many great questions, and then he's listening to this hopefully, and he's like, "Oh, they're oh, talking man, about buttholes now." <laughs> buttholes. Here we go. Why did why? why did I ever reply to these people? Why did I ever? associate myself with them <laughs> <laughs> yep reputation God ruined forever, forever. Yeah. well it was fun <laughs> while it lasted <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> so yeah 
if you have any other questions, even even if it's about the podcast, like uh, we've had a friend <laughs> message us like, hey, how do you record your podcast? You know, we tell them like, yeah. how do we sync? We just do because we're gods. So uh, if you have, you have questions about like the podcast in general, like how do you record your podcast? You know, what does likes do behind the scenes to make you all sound so good? Because, you know reasons and like what platforms do you guys use to get your podcast out there like how did you start like we uh, you know we'll answer those too pop them in hell i mean there's if you're asking it there's plenty of other people wondering the same thing so never Absolutely. never never such a thing as a dumb question um yeah except when it's about <laughs> cartoon buttholes <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> um, <laughs> that it might actually be a dumb <laughs> question. <laughs> and if you have questions about like, other games, like every once in a while we'll get someone pop in Discord, like, hey, what do you think of XYZ Game? Or, hey, what are your recommended Game Boy games? I'm trying to get into the system. You know, ask us in Discord. We'll, you know, we may not answer it on the podcast episode, but we'll answer you in Discord. I, I watched it like. I I look through it once a day, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> so I mean, <laughs> yeah, I I I, I look at it for sure. Um, like, so yeah, I mean, ask away. Like it doesn't have to just be per like. Oh, I don't know anything about asterisks. I'm not going to ask a question. Like, psh, throw some questions out there. We'll answer them. Um, yeah. But if you do have thoughts and suggestions about the podcast, we'd love to hear your feedback about it. Um, you know. Let legs myself and and Mo know whether it's through Discord, Twitter, Twitch, whatever it is in the world, or if you leave like a rating thing nowadays, like those Apple Podcasts and the Google Podcast stuff have like those five star ratings. If you just hit the five star at the very end and just put this is good, that works great for me as well. Um, <laughs> I mean, I won't complain to a five star rating, uh, um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but we do want to make the podcast forever, forever better. You know, be- bettering the podcast for you all to listen to. So, if there, if you think there is a point that we can better ourselves, please uh, let us know. We'd love to hear it. We're always open to critical feedback. I give it to Mo all the time. So. <laughs> <laughs> But um, yeah. you can find me, E Bloody Candy, on Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok. Uh, there's probably some other social media outlets that I don't know about that I'm a part of. But uh, Twitter, Twitch, and YouTube are my three big ones. And obviously, you can hit me up in Discord. I'm EBC in Discord. Um, you can find our fantastic, wonderful, beautiful producer legs at Sprinty Legs on Twitch and Twitter, uh, legs on YouTube, and www.sprintylegs.com to see all of her projects and some behind the scenes work that she has been working on. Mo, where can they find you? You can find me on YouTube, Twitch, and Twitter, all slash Moolah, which is M O E L L E U H. Um, also Instagram, but again, still haven't posted it's anything true. because I don't see the appeal <laughs> of it, and I also have nothing to post there. <laughs> but maybe someday, uh, yeah, that that's pretty much uh, all of my socials. Um, of course, you can just find links to all of these social medias on our actual website, which is on thisisgameboy.com. For your Very ease. true. And if you are interested in following Mr. Alberto Gonzalez, you can follow him on Twitter at Alberto underscore McCalby, M-C-A-L-B-Y. Make sure to check out his SoundCloud as well, too, where he actually has a bunch of his console works with unreleased music as well for certain games. And you can find his SoundCloud at Joe McCalby, J-O-E-M-C-A-L-B-Y. Um pretty pretty awesome that that's actually up there and a thing so and uh if we have a patreon so if you're if you all want to support the the podcast monetarily we do have a patreon uh where it is tied into discord you all will get rewards uh i don't i i don't use patreon i don't know how it works there's tiers there's rewards i just know that when mo tells us that if we hit twenty dollars a month 
we're going to start live streaming our podcast episodes. So if you do want to see that, you know, don't feel obligated by any means, but it does help. It helps pay some some of the things that we have going on here. So uh, if you're not into the whole Patreon thing, we do have PayPal, which is a one-time thing. However, PayPal and Discord can't tie in together. So if you do donate via PayPal, please, please, please let us know. We want to thank you, reward you in some way possible for supporting us. And again, monetary support is never needed. By any means, like if you don't want to, then don't do it. You can you support us every time you listen to one of our episodes. You support us every time you leave a five star rating on the Apple Podcast thing. You excuse me. You support us whenever I burp on podcast. You support us. You support us no matter <laughs> what you do. Just chilling and hanging out with us in Discord, telling us, "Hey, nice episode." You know, is more than enough for us at times. So. um and then, yeah, oh, and if SoundCloud ain't whatever podcast they ain't your thing, Bo and Legs put a bunch of work in and got us the YouTube channel all set up. So there's playlists there with all of the light and full episodes that you can go check out and listen to with some gameplay footage happening uh, alongside the actual podcast episode if it warrants some gameplay footage. Yeah, whenever it's uh, doable. Uh, yeah. To put that in, uh, it's always like a playthrough in the in the quote unquote yeah. background. Did I hit everything? Did I do it? Yeah, I'm oh, pretty sure that's uh, covers ever. about all. Yeah, I knew I could do it. <laughs> <laughs> we got everything out. Oh. <laughs> so uh, yeah. so yeah. next episode, Mo, what? Uh, what what we gonna do? Uh, it's been a while since we've done such an episode, <laughs> and we always love doing these types of. We episodes. haven't talked about this individual uh, in a while either. Yeah, it, it's been a while since since we've came across <laughs> him. Um, but uh, to quote him, he sure will be back next time stay tuned Best question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.